Good morning, and thank you for being so cooperative and quiet. <laughs> Welcome to the March 12th meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors. Would the clerk please call the roll? Yes, good morning. Supervisor Cerna? Here. Desmond? Here. Hume, Hume? Here. Frost? Here. Kennedy? Here. And you have a quorum. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is Cablecast Live on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-First Cable Systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated Friday, March 15th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. The Board of Supervisors fosters public engagement during the meeting and encourages public participation, civility, and use of courteous language. The Board does not condone the use of profanity, vulgar language, gestures, or other inappropriate behavior, including personal attacks or threats directed towards any meeting participant. Seating is limited and available on a first-come, first-served basis. Each speaker will be given two minutes to make a public comment and are limited to making one comment per agenda or off agenda. Item, please be mindful of the public comment procedures to avoid being interrupted while making your comment. To make a comment in person, please fill out a speaker request form and hand it to clerk staff. The chairperson will open public comments for each agenda or off agenda item and direct the clerk to call the name of each speaker. When the clerk calls your name, please come to the podium and make your comment. If a speaker is unavailable to make a comment prior to the closing of public comments, the speaker waives their request to speak and the clerk will file the speaker request form in the record. The clerk will also manage the timer and allow each speaker two minutes to make a comment. You may send written comments by email to boardclerk at sacccounty.gov and your comments will be routed to the board and filed in the record. And if you need an accommodation pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act or for medical or other reasons, please see clerk staff for assistance or contact the clerk's office at 916-874-5451 or by email at boardclerk at sacccounty.gov. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding of the meeting procedures. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Madam Clerk, please call the first item. Uh, for your first item, these are off agenda comments, and it looks like we have two speakers, and I will bring up their names. Our first speaker is Kai. Good morning. Good morning, all uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Kai Hong. Uh, I mail a letter to DA office, Mr. Ho, to confirm my father, Wun Kong On, was killed by Hit and one driver, Mr. Fong, and the DA case number is 99F08735. I also send the information to Ms. Lisa Travers and Mr. Eric Jung, but I received no response. The back of the document has the handwritten note from DA office and the the office staff refused to review my father's uh, case file at the office. Uh, all Board of Supervisor piece of order and investigation to see if I was given fake information about my father's case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does Nancy? Good morning and thank you. Usually we talk about our efforts to keep the lower American River in as natural a state as possible when facing flood protection construction. And we are thrilled that you are all board members for SAFCA and will represent us well. We are continuing to reach out to more agencies and political representatives. Our period for addressing our comments in writing to the US Corps of Engineers is over but we still want to reach out to the community and educate all to the wonders of the river's natural resources and to this project's devastating results as seen in Campus Commons and River Park. A recent essay I read stated the importance of getting children out to experience nature. 
In this way, they are introduced to a world that jumpstarts their curiosity on how things grow, what is the purpose on Earth, how do they thrive, how are these resources related. This is where the wonder leads to inquisitiveness and to the knowledge and fun that science has to offer. I was an outdoor education counselor for Stanislaus County Schools many years ago. The 12-year-olds would walk through the forest with me, learning to identify the pine trees and the low-growth vegetation. My experience is different. I went to elementary school in Staten Island, New York. Our playground was fenced, a fenced-in enclosure with the entire play area covered in cement. If you are lucky to get a ball, you could hit it against the large vertical concrete wall. In contrast, our California schools appear like paradise and more in tune with nature. When we have decisions to make, sometimes very difficult decisions, let's do our best to keep our green spaces green, our trees healthy, and our fish happy, and our American River and its environs healthy. Thank you. Have a thank great day, and thank you for your work. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Back to future public comments for Off Agenda Matters. And Close the queue, and we will move on to your consent matters. For your consent items 2 through 39, I will be asking the board to drop item 3, authorization to appoint Anita Maldonado as the executive director of SETA. So move. Second. Please vote. Unanimous vote. And that concludes the notes from the clerk. Okay, are there any members of the board that have questions or would like to pull anything from consent at this time? Seeing Mr. Hume. Thank you, Chair. I apologize for the late entry <laughs> right. there. Uh, I don't want to pull anything. I just would like to make a comment on item number 18. Okay. Item 18 is to authorize the Director of Transportation to execute the public highway at grade crossing agreement. Great. I just want to congratulate uh, DOT staff. I know that this uh, negotiation process with UP has been a long and arduous process. They are always the 800-pound gorilla in any room. Mm. And now that we have this one behind us, let's get working on Waterman Road. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members? All right. Seeing none, do we have any member of the public that would like to address the board on an item on consent? We have no public comments for, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, for item 13, Charles from Frost. Charles. Good morning. Morning. I was reviewing the Watt Avenue, which I think is 13, the safe stay thing. I just had a couple, couple comments. Um, <laughs> Which, which item is this, Charles? Charles, which item is this? This is the Watt Avenue safe state oh, thing, okay. right? That's 13. I may I have written 13. 13. I may have meant 12. I may have made 12. a mistake there. It's, yeah, it's, it's 12. Okay. 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 Sorry I was what, it was really odd to see you commenting on item 13, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what it is. Sorry. Okay. The, um, I'm actually pretty excited about this. I think that it's the move in the right direction. I think this is probably going to be the best county-operated shelter. Um, I wish it was larger, obviously, but this a lot of what is going to work is going to be put here. I think you'll actually see a lot of exits from homelessness out of this shelter. A couple of the things that I saw that I think should be addressed is the first aid kits should have Narcan in them as well as the defibrillators and other first aid type stuff. Um, the no or very limited food in the neighborhoods, I think, is something that could be addressed. I think that's been a mistake at some of the other shelters, is not allowing people to have their own food. I've heard a lot of issues based around that. And then um, I think this is probably something that's addressed in here, but I couldn't find, is some of the HVAC components of the actual building I think are going to be an issue for you guys long term. But um, anyway, that's all I really had. I think this is actually going to be pretty successful. Thank you. Appreciate the comments, Charles. That concludes your public comments for consent matters. Okay, is there a motion? Please vote. Unanimous vote. Okay, item 40 is the presentation of service award recognizing Angel Saltero for 30 years of service with Sacramento County.
Good, come on up. Good morning, Chair Kennedy and the board. Melissa Lloyd with CPS. Um, very happy day today. We are here celebrating uh, one of our social workers, Angel Sotero, who has 30 years of service with Child Protective Services specifically. And I want to just share very briefly that Mr. Sotero um, began his career with the department uh, 30 years ago in 1994 where for the first two decades he worked in our Family Reunification Bureau servicing families who, where kids had been removed from their parents and he helped to get families back together and get kids on a plan to permanency. And then in 2015, he transferred over to an indirect service role um, in our court services program where he has done some instrumental work in our due diligence um, practice where he's looked for missing parents of the children that we serve. Um, he has worked very hard. He's had tremendous dedication and um, his teamwork with everyone has been unwavering. Angel's here obviously with us today and also in the audience we have his supervisor, his program manager and other members from DCFAS and then some of his family members were not able to make it today but they are watching remotely. Mr. Soltero has a few comments that he would like to make, but please join me in congratulating him on his 30 years. Um, hello everyone, it is nice, and I am deeply honored to be here with you in this beautiful building. I also love the other great building across the street the one that lights up the colorful purple beam into our evening sky and possibly into space and or heaven when your Sacramento Kings team feels good and things are going well and they win their games. The beam makes me feel connected to the community. I can recall the first few years I did not know if I would continue to work further after hearing a coworker who voiced concerns of high caseloads and low morale. He eventually left. However, I am still here standing. On another occasion at a delinquency hearing due to interpreters being short staffed, I was asked if I spoke Spanish and if I would kindly translate. Next, I was sworn in and translated. <clears throat> Words of encouragement for co-workers to employees who came before me. I admire and look up to you. For current employees, some of you are right behind me. <clears throat> Keep up the great work. When COVID was here, just know I consider you all first responders, regardless of your title. <clears throat> For beginning employees, it's great to work here. Your, your day will never be the same. Join your union. Having a toolkit at your disposal is necessary and could include being able to listen, being transparent, and having empathy. My journey has been blessed, and I give my greatest gratitude to the following individuals. Alvaro Indian Yaki Lopez, Dr. Professor Isabel Hernandez Serna, Professor Juan Hernandez, retired Professor Chair Ronald Bolt, David Growlick, my friends and family. A thank you to Micah, PJ Davis, and all staff at Dixon Family Services. I thank uh, our red team, United Public Employees, Local One, including but not limited to Executive Director Ted Sumera. Where are you, Ted? There you. Uh, um, Agent John Bonilla, and all UPE staff for their work. In numbers, there is strength. Together, we are strong. I thank the management and administration team, Natalie DeMartin, Kamalali, Arobia Battle, 
Melissa Loy, <coughs> Director Michelle Cajellas, Cajellas. <coughs> a special thanks to Peter Yim. I could thank more individuals, however, that will take me all night. <coughs> Just know if I work with you, I know who you are and what you do, and you are invaluable. You and your staff and the 11,900 plus employees are unsung heroes who do the daily in and out <coughs> work to make our organization run. <coughs> Last, I thank the individuals who come in their most vulnerable times. They allow me to do my job and support the community. I appreciate the opportunity to engage with our community and keep their light shining like the beam across the street. <coughs> With regards to the change in individuals, it's important to know change is not static, rather it's dynamic. Please note, because people can and do change. Last but not least, I would like to thank my mother, Antonia Soltero, who is no longer with us, but it is because of her that I am here before you. Thank you for the recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Soltera, um, I, I just want to say uh, on behalf of the board a couple of things, uh, and then we do have others chiming in. Um, <clears throat> we've all dealt with CPS on a regular basis. Um, most of us, if not all of us, have been on ride-alongs and, and, and seen the work that uh, you all do on a daily basis. And um, it's, it's God's work. It's difficult. It's hard. Um, and to do it for 30 years shows that uh, you have a heart bigger than that beam. And um, we sincerely appreciate your 30 years. And if it would be okay after the board has time to, um, we don't always do this, but I would be honored if you would uh, uh, let the board take a photo with you. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Soltero, I, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I just wanted to also articulate my thanks to you and the work uh, of everyone at DCFAS. You do the most difficult work in the county, the most important work in the county that I imagine is can be filled with heartache, but also moments of absolute joy when you see a success uh, success with a family or a child that you serve. So thank you. I, I have a daughter right now who's finishing up her master's in social work, and I've told her so many times how much I've been inspired um, by the work of our, our county social workers. And uh, I just wish you all the best in your retirement, and thank you for your service to Sacramento County. You're welcome. All right. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next item, please. Okay. Item 41 is the presentation of resolution recognizing March 8th, 2024 as International Women's Day and March 2024 as Women's History Month.
Good morning, board, members of the public. It's my pleasure today to recognize March 8th as International Women's Day and March 2024 as Women's History Month. Uh, there's no better time to do that than when in the presence of our members of the Sacramento County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls, which is dedicated to helping inspire inclusion for the more than 800,000 women. That's 51% of our population in this county. The commission is especially dedicated to inspiring and supporting inclusion for women who again represent over 56% of residents with income, um, with income below the poverty threshold, for women and girls who are victims of domestic violence, for women and children who are living without housing, and for women who need access to affordable child care while working and continuing to the con contributing to the economy of Sacramento County. And uh, women who, uh, you know, really are the lifeblood of every person that is sitting in this room. I guarantee there is more than one, whether it's your mother, your grandmother, a teacher, an aunt, in my case, four daughters, uh, that, that you look up to and, and who made this a better county. So um, I have asked, by the way, that the commission have an opportunity to come back at a later date to give a thorough uh, report on the work of the commission. I know that they've been doing some exciting stuff, uh, including some uh, real good stuff with uh, Sac State and others. And uh, so they have agreed to do that. So we will be hearing from them at that time. But right now, I'd like to hand the mic over to Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to stand here on behalf of the women in Sacramento County. I'm here with um, commissioners, three of whom are new commissioners that you have appointed. I'd like to introduce um, Tracy Stuckroth, uh, Eva Robinson, uh, Tamiza Wash, <laughs> and Rachel Williams. And then we have a, a junior commissioner in waiting, um, <laughs> which is Jamie uh, Ro Robinson. And so um, thank you for your appointments to the commission. They've been tremendous. I want to thank you for coming out on Saturday for International Women's Day. I do want to um, let the community know that we had a wonderful inaugural festival, and we will be having them annually. Um, I do want to leave these with you in case you didn't get them, and, and um, because it will show you all the services that we connected with women and girls. Uh, on Saturday, and we look forward to coming back and sharing research that we have for the first time looking at the status of women and girls in Sacramento County with the help of the Sacramento State Institute of Social Research. So thank you for your support for women and girls. We will be um, looking at the budget this year with you and hopefully doing some advising, so uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you for wearing our buttons today, Supervisor Cernan. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say one thing? I also want to thank Michelle Callejas and her staff. Um, they've done an extraordinary um, work of support and supported our festival as well as our everyday work. And I really want to shout out to their work every day, but also with the commission. Thank you. Next item. Item 42 is the retroactive authority to execute an expenditure agreement with United Way California Capital Region in an amount not to exceed $2 million for implementation and fund distribution of a guaranteed income pilot with the MEF Associates in an amount not to exceed 500000 for an evaluation of the guaranteed income pilot. Good morning. Chair Kennedy and board members. Oh, it scared me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, Michelle Callejas, I'm a director of Child, Family, and Adult Services. Um, and as uh, our clerk explained, we're here to request retroactive authority to enter into two contracts that would allow us to implement a guaranteed income program pilot. Our contract, <clears throat> one contract is with United Way, 
California Capital Region to provide implementation and fund distribution services. And the second is with MEF Associates for completion of the evaluation component. The pilot is one of several strategies within our county's Family First Comprehensive Prevention Plan, which I'll explain briefly. But before I get started, I just want to acknowledge my team who did so much work researching various uh, guaranteed income programs, gathering data, doing literature reviews, learning about benefits protection, and consulting with experts across the country and here in California. I had no idea how complex guaranteed income programs could be. So thank you, Christy Bomback, Karen Parker, and of course, Melissa Lloyd for all their supports. I'd also like to thank United Way and MEF for working so closely with us to get us to where we are today. Um, to ensure strong implementation should this board approve this recommendation. And uh, MEF came from Oakland and Denver to be here today to show support, so thank you. So, here we go. So what is Family First? So in March of 2021, the California Department of Social Services issued the Family First Prevention Services Block Grant. And it is an opt-in county, it's an opt-in program for counties. And in order to access the funding, child welfare and probation had to establish a collaborative comprehensive prevention plan. So we worked with our Sacramento County Probation Department as well as our behavioral health partners to put together our comprehensive prevention plan. The prevention plan had to be developed with community input and had to include prevention services that support the ability of parents and families to provide safe, to provide safe stable and nurturing environments for their children. Additionally, interventions had to be culturally responsive and appropriate and tailored to meet the needs of families who are disproportionately represented in the child welfare system, including Native American and Alaskan Native families, families of color, and LGBTQ plus children and youth. Our strategy today that we are uh, speaking about, as well as our broader strategies, are focused on promoting child and family well-being and decreasing disparities for black and Native American children between the ages of zero and five, as those two groups are most disproportionately impacted by child welfare in our county. We submitted our proposed uh, plan to CDSS in April of 2023. We were the first county to submit and the first county to receive approval. So these next few slides, I'm gonna provide some data that will uh, support how we came to our population of focus. And so what we have here, these are uh, data just specific to children zero to five. That is our target population. And this first column here shows the breakdown of all children children in Sacramento County between the ages of birth and five. So you can see of all kids in this age group, 43.9 are white, six tenths percent are Native American, 29.2% Latino, 11.2% black, and 15.2% Asian Pacific Islander. The subsequent uh, columns that you see are different decision points within the child welfare system at the front end. So allegations, those are all calls to our hotline. Then evaluate out if the, hot, if the calls don't have enough information to warrant an in-person response, we evaluate it out. Then it goes on to investigations, substantiated investigations, cases that are opened with court oversight without, and then child removal. So you can see over here, uh, Black children represent 11.2% of the total birth to five population. But as you move across, you can see they represent 32.7% of allegations, 32.3% of investigations, 32% of substantiated investigations, 33.5% of cases opened with court oversight, so formal, formal court involvement, and 34% of children removed. They are also further downstream 
are the most likely to spend longer terms in foster care, longer time in foster care, have the most placement instability, more likely to be in congregate care settings, and more likely to cross over to the juvenile justice system. Although the numbers aren't as high because of the, the small N, the second group with the most disparities are Native American uh, children and families in this age group. And I'll go into a few more details on these next couple of slides. So this slide delves deeper and just breaks down very clearly the impact and disproportionate representation of African American children birth to five in our system. So as you can see, black children 4.3 as compared to their white counterparts zero to five. Uh, 4.3 times as likely to have an allegation. So that means right out the gate, there are more people in our community uh, making reports on African American children and families. They are four times as, 4.6 times as likely to be investigated, 3.9 times as likely to have a new case with court oversight, four and a half times as likely to be removed from their families. Next is the breakdown for Native American children. So similarly, you can see 2.2 times as likely to be the subject of an allegation, 2.9 times as likely to be investigated, 2.8 times as likely to have a substantiation, almost six times as likely to have an informal supervision case, one and a half times as likely to have a case with court oversight, and then two times as likely to be separated from their families than their white counterparts. So Sacramento County has a great history of um, using data to allocate resources to populations that have been disproportionately impacted by various systems and issues. Over two decades ago, this board allocated funding to establish the Birth and Beyond Collaborative and all nine family resource centers. Um, and they were located in communities experiencing significant challenges. When data showed that black children were dying two to three times the rate of other chil children, Supervisor Cerna spearheaded the Black Child Legacy Campaign and establishment of community incubator leads. The family resource centers and community incubator leads along with the overall Black Child Legacy campaign efforts and the Birth and Beyond uh, Family Collaborative have promoted family stability, self-sufficiency, child and family well-being, and they prevented families from having contact with child welfare or deepening contact with child welfare. This guaranteed income proposal along with the rest of our prevention plan has those same goals. So in addition to the data, we had to conduct uh, community input to help inform our prevention plan. So we drew upon various sources. We did a couple of community provider feedback forums, listening sessions with parents and with youth who had involvement with CPS, listening sessions with families receiving services from our family resource centers and community incubator lead sites. And then we also drew from data gathered from the children's uh, report card and the first five so, uh, survey. What was striking is that these four themes came up in all of those different listening sessions and surveys. Basic concrete needs, stable and affordable housing, affordable and accessible childcare, and accessibility to services. So in addressing these needs, this is our overall comprehensive prevention plan. We included six strategies including funding for basic needs, increased child care capacity, the guaranteed income pilot we're, we're discussing today, a mobile unit to create more accessibility to resources, updated mandated reporter training that focuses on assisting families with resources if there isn't suspected abuse. And this strategy is in alignment with the statewide effort to shift from mandated reporters to community supporters. And then we're also conducting, we will be conducting a DEI institutional analysis to assess whether there are policies, practices, or other issues within our department that may inadvertently be contributing to racial disparities. 
So what is guaranteed income? It is basically recurring cash payments to a particular population for a specified amount of time to support recipients in meeting needs that they deem most important. They often target members who are most impacted by disparities. In this case, African American and Native American children zero to five and their families are most disproportionately impacted by the child welfare system, and we are proposing that our pilot focus on both populations. It cre this pilot creates the opportunity to promote family stability, child and family well-being, and reduce contact with child welfare services. I, I love this quote because it gives it a little more uh, real taste. One mother in the Magnolia Mother's Trust Fund used her first guaranteed income payment to re-enroll in phlebotomy classes, which she had stopped for years after being unable to pay tuition. She has since graduated from her phlebotomy program and transitioned to work as a phlebotomist, allowing her to earn higher wages to support herself and her family. So again, we just showed the data that reflect the disproportionate representation of African American and Native children in our, in our system. We delved further in the data to see what areas in our community are most impacted by our agency. And so we identified the top zip codes of family, with families zero to five, African American families zero to five that have the most contact with our system. And these are the zip codes that we will be focusing on. 958, the, these, are, these are zip codes that are quite familiar to this board as they've also been zip codes that we've targeted with other efforts, again, utilizing our data. <clears throat> For Native American kids, zero to five, we looked at those connected to Wilton Rancheria, which is our only uh, federally recognized tribe lo locally, as well as those receiving tribal TANF. Um, and we identified there are roughly 75 families in these zip codes that are Native American, and we'll be working with Wilton Rancheria, the Sacramento Native American Health Center, and Tribal TANF to um, develop the most culturally responsive, appropriate um, recruitment and engagement strategies to hopefully encourage them all to um, at least apply. So how do participants spend their funds? There's, you know, great concern that, you know, what if they spend it on drugs, alcohol? What if they, you know, spend it not on basic needs? So this is a guaranteed income pilots um, dashboard, which is a partnership of the Center for Guaranteed Income Research, the Stanford Basic Income Lab, and Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. And it shows expenditures from 26 different national pilots. And as you can see, participants spend most of their income on the same things as the rest of us, basic needs. And you can see the breakdown there uh, for yourselves. This doesn't break it down, but uh, when Mayor Tubbs implemented the SEED program in Stockton, uh, he, he said one of the, the biggest group of naysayers were his own staff because they were worried that recipients would spend it on drugs and alcohol. And, and their evaluation showed that less than 1% of expenditures tracked were for drugs and alcohol. That being said, right, they can go Thank with... That's actually a good time to interrupt, I okay. guess. <laughs> Director Cern, or Supervisor Cerna. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna beat you to the punch here with a, a forthcoming slide here, Michelle, but um, back to the, the quote uh, that you cited mm -hmm. about the individual who used uh, guaranteed income to help uh, finish her uh, certification of phlebotomy. Do we have any data that's similar to this chart um, uh, that's a, a you know amalgamation of different uh, guaranteed income uh, programs from around the country, around the state, that gives us some insight about sustainable. I, I don't know how to characterize it. Uh, kind of the sustainable use of funds. So, in other words, funds that would be uh, received and then maybe leveraged with other sources of income to um, to finish an education mm -hmm. uh, to. Um, otherwise, uh, become mo more uh, sustain uh, sustainable in terms of income condition after the time has uh, uh, transpired that the income is available. 
Right, I, I get it. I love that question. Um, I don't have the data in front of me, but again, I know that uh, my team has researched so many different programs, and there were different examples of folks doing just what this um, recipient did with the phlebotomy program. They've been able to complete their education or start an education, which then enables them to get a better job. Some have increased from zero employment to part-time employment. Some went from part-time employment to full-time employment because they, they had uh, this, this cash allowed them to fix their car, which allowed them to go drive further in order to take a job that paid better wages um, and benefits. Yeah, I, I think it would be helpful um, in the future that we did have some access to um, that information um, because I think we can all agree that that um, you know, everyone has a different circumstance, obviously, that, that may receive guaranteed income uh, dollars, but uh, it seems to me that we want to um, collectively maximize the impact of um, essentially limited time funding um, so that, you know, the, the goal should be that we don't have to do guaranteed income. Um, in other words, that people, you know, find themselves uh, new footing, um, whether it's Again, education or career, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, I don't know if others are ex expecting to address the the board on on the general subject of guaranteed income this morning, but um, perhaps they can speak to it as, as well. And uh, you know, I also um, hope that it's not just a matter of writing a check, right? It's also you know um, working with the recipient to help them understand here's how you can, um, in fact, maximize the use of the $500 a month or $1,000 a month, whatever it might be, um, so that they don't go into, you know, months of receiving um, uh, augmented income without maybe a game plan on how best to use it. Yeah, yes, I, and I appreciate that question. The last thing we want to do is at the end of the pilot, they're, they just go right back. So there will be services and supports that, that we'll try to connect them to. Um, our whole goal is promoting self-sufficiency, family stability. Um, there's so much conflation between poverty and child neglect that if we address this, we can see, does that help? We know there have been other pilots that have shown decreased involvement with child welfare, and that is our hope here, with the ultimate goal of achieving self-sufficiency. Great. Thank you. M Michelle, just to follow up on kind of that area, um, so we, we have uh, the statistics on those who have been successful and so forth and what they're doing and all of that. For, for those who, I don't know how to put this, for those who, who maybe didn't uh, utilize the income in ways that we had envisioned or hoped, um, uh, do we look into that to, to identify, you know, why? Uh, how maybe you know there could be interventions uh, you know to to to, to remedy that um, for that individual and the family. Uh, is, is, do we do that type of follow up as well? You know what? I believe we are going to be doing an ongoing evaluation. So afterward, will we have that opportunity to get a little more detail? Um, yes, we'll be doing both quant quantitative survey data collection throughout the process, throughout the entire pilot, and we'll also be doing a qualitative longitudinal survey, so we'll be following up to 20 families at different time points throughout the entire evaluation and diving more in depth into exactly how they're using the money, how they made those decisions. Okay, if you're going on any further, you got to get to the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. And, and MEF is here to, to uh, answer some more of the evaluation uh, questions, which we're still we're still developing. So thank you for the, the question. So the impacts of guaranteed income, you know, just these, these quotes, guaranteed income payments help me pay for my child's dental work. Uh, the next one with receiving the guaranteed income, it took a lot of stress off trying to find different organizations to assist with certain things. I was able to pay bills. That left me more time to work with, look for a job that would work with my schedule, which is how I ended up coming across my current job. 
So these are some of the outcomes. This increased ability to meet basic needs, improved mental health, physical health, and overall well-being, increased employment, income security, housing stability, increased enrichment, and parent-child bonding, and then improved educational outcomes and child development, which is so critical for our littles. Um, and, and this paired with all the first five funded services we have available in our county could really help uh, lead us to some uh, great outcomes for this pilot. So who's eligible? Uh, he, he, these, are the, these are the eligibility requirements. So parents and legal guardians of African American and Native American children birth to five. They must live in the zip codes we previously discussed. They must live with their parent or legal guardian. Uh, the family residing full time in one of the identified zip codes. If unhoused, they could be previously there, and of course we would work to connect them the resources to get them housed. Um, the family income um, under 200% federal poverty level. So uh, for example, if it was a family of four, two parents, two kids, they must have an annual income of less than 62,400. Um, and then the other one is families not already receiving guaranteed income from another uh, pilot program. So we also, we have United Way implementing um, a guaranteed income program. I believe they're on their third cohort. Uh, the California Department of Social Services is funding a guaranteed income uh, program for foster youth, uh, young adults exiting the foster care system. Um, and so some of our youth are benefiting from that. So they can't be receiving another uh, guaranteed income. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Um, it just occurred to me, Michelle, um, why, why are uh, we looking at this from the standpoint of zip code? Um, the reason I ask is maybe, that, I don't know if, if that's a, some kind of federal requirement, but it seems to me that um, th there's more to be, uh, I, I think, gleaned from the socioeconomic information that comes from census block than it does zip codes, which is a postal artifact, right? So uh, is, there any, is there any specialness to zip codes versus other means to uh, identify the geography involved? It, it's simply related to the administrative data we're able to pull from our child welfare system, uh, the uh, information system, the CWS CMS. Um, and so tracking by zip code, we went to the six where, the, where there was the most contact with African American families zero to five. Um, I most fall within particular census tracts, but I hear your, your point that some may fall out of it I mean, into a different zip code. Hypothetically, you could have much more intense poverty in a, cens in a census tract and in zip, zip co codes. Outside of a zip code uh, where you have identified maybe broader mm -hmm. uh, poverty or other, you know, metrics. Um, so I just kind of question that, but it sounds to me like it, it's a matter of fitting a square peg into a square hole. Yeah, the challenge. Um, but it's certainly something we can explore uh, with the hopes this one is so successful, we're able to find funding for another one. Uh, because it, it, this, it's a question that comes up frequently when we're looking at zip codes. Uh, and, and neighborhoods have cross centrist uh, census tracts as well. All right, thank you. So uh, the next slide is recruitment, participation, enrollment. So it'll be an online application, and we will be providing in person assistance to help them. Uh, with the application. It does include a baseline survey, and that baseline survey will look at like demographics, economic stability, um, access to health care, their assets, education, and so forth. Subsequent participation in the research is voluntary. Um, however, MEF um, believes they can get good participation rates. They will be making ongoing efforts to engage with families to explain the process, answer questions, and encourage participation in follow-up surveys. Um, additionally, we'll be providing incentives for each survey complete, completed, and then if they complete all of them, there is an extra incentive at the end. Um, In-person interviews will be completed, and then we'll have a certain number of participants involved in collaborative filmmaking, um, and we would pay incentives to those recipients as well. So once folks apply, 
um, the intervention group will be contacted to confirm eligibility and then benefits counseling will be provided. One of the things we wanted to make sure we didn't do is compromise the benefits folks might be receiving. And we just uh, got word from CDSS that the way we designed our pilot we meet criteria so that folks who are receiving CalWORKs and CalFresh will not be impacted by this pilot. Um, the control group will also be contacted and informed of their group assignment. Uh, both groups, again, will be encouraged to uh, participate in ongoing research. Um, and then the intervention group will receive $725 a month for 12 months. And the goal is to start in July of 2024. So some of the evaluation uh, components, uh, these are the different areas, food, secure, food uh, security, ability to meet basic needs, housing stability, employment, access to transportation, chronic stress, mental health, educational experience and attainment, uh, quality of increased enjoyment of parent-child interactions, and then as well as administrative data uh, that we can provide. Uh, child welfare data, government benefits, utilization, and unemployment claims. So that concludes um, my presentation, and I welcome questions. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for the presentation, and thanks for taking the time to to talk with me and, and some concerns that I've, I've had with just some of the, the you know, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced about the guaranteed basic income. Um, so I, I look forward to this pilot because I think mm -hmm. this is really the w right way to, to do a pilot, to really focus it towards a population that, it, that is most in need. Um, and, I, and, I, and I really appreciate the evalu evaluation efforts that will be at the end. I think it'll be, it'll be really valuable to, do a side-by-side -side between um, the results from that Stanford study where mm -hmm. the money was spent for those participants in these general studies and then where actually the money ends up being spent by those who participate in our mm -hmm. program. Um, I'll be very, very uh, interested in seeing that. And, and to, to piggyback on Supervisor Cerna's comments, most interested to see how this results in you know resiliency and self-sufficiency yeah. for these folks who are going to be helped by this. So. I think I, I'm about policy that, you know, results in, in tangible outcomes. We've seen those tangible outcomes from the Black Child Legacy Campaign and the investments have definitely seen benefits to those communities. And, and your chart that you opened up with, I mean, that is just compelling yeah. that we need to be doing more to help these uh, uh, populations in particular. So um, we'll really look forward to see how this goes, um, that it, it will be a success and, and really will be helping people and uh, appreciate you being here today to present. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Hume. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I, I echo uh, Supervisor Desmond's comments um, almost straight through. I'm not sure how I feel about GBI programs yet, so I think dipping toe in the pool with a pilot program is probably a good idea. I also appreciate uh, that the stories you highlighted did speak to that self-resiliency access, yeah. that this, uh, this was a hand up, not a hand out. Um, but I guess the, the one concern I have, or what I'd like a little more information, is what happens at the end of the 12-month program? Does this create a dependency, or are we, are we, is there a, a runway, and it's uh, you know, clearly advertised, hey, th this is coming to an end? Are we hoping that it gets refunded and continued? I mean, what is, what is our goal at the end of the, the 12 months? Yeah, so our ultimate goal is to you know, promote self-sufficiency, uh, family stability, and then reduce involvement with the child welfare or juvenile justice system. Um, the, the, the participants will be informed and reminded along the way, like there's six more months, there's three more months, right? And during this time, we'll also be uh, connecting them to services and supports to try to promote that longer term self-sufficiency and sustainability. Um, you know, there may be some folks we'll see um, that, that weren't able to get to something that allowed them to, um, and we'll certainly be evaluating that as part of the overall evaluation. But um, other studies have showed the majority are able to continue, and then there's ongoing 
um, pilot or programs right now. I think the the mayors and counties for guaranteed income they're tracking as of December 23rd like 151 pilots taking place nationally. So I think over the years, and we'll be able to contribute if this is approved. Um, there's be there'll be more and more evaluation data with longer term to see where are they in a year, five years, um, and so forth. And so if I can just make sure I heard you correctly, our goal at the end of the 12 months is hopefully to obviously have good outcomes in yeah. that period, but also do some sort of engagement or warm handoff into another program, but not necessarily to continue funding this program. It's we will take a break and evaluate our data and, and see. Yeah, we are definitely slated to end at 12 okay months um, you know we're allocating two million for that that piece and then our goal is connecting them to other resources in our community um, and then if this is successful use our data to chase other funding I won't be coming back to the board to ask for more funding but um, you know and hopefully in the in the end it results in policy changes um, so that would be the ideal great thank great. you so where's Cerna thank you um, one question that I admit I should have probably asked during our briefings uh, was, or is, uh, if a if a recipient, potential recipient uh, for um, guaranteed income is currently on general assistance or receiving SNAP benefits, um, is there any uh, assessment of whether or not the amount of guaranteed income Combined with whatever, you know, other source of income they may may have, um, would make them ineligible, and then um, have that affect how they spend the the money. Yeah, great question. It will not affect CalFresh, CalWorks, and we will be doing benefits counseling during the enrollment process and determining eligibility. So if they want to come in, we do benefits counseling. We'll be having somebody do that specifically. But CDSS just said we meet the eligibility um, in order to not impact CalFresh um, and CalWorks, because this is really intended to be a supplement, not a replacement. Right. Yeah, yeah that was my concern is that yeah. uh, somehow we end up subsidizing the very benefits that we administer. <laughs> right, so. right. Does that, does that include uh, Medi-Cal? Yes, okay. it does, yeah. Uh, and, and then just, just out of curiosity, I, mean, I would assume this is taxable income, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Supervisor Frost. Oh, oh. oh, it's a government exclusion for taxable income, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, we got a thumbs up from Supervisor Hume on the way out. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Uh, hi, Michelle. I want to thank you and your team for the in-depth briefing that you gave me on this. I, I want to say, I'll say to everyone what I said to you, which is when I first heard the word guaranteed income, my little conservative red flags started <laughs> to go up, and I was like, okay. Uh, but uh, in looking at this, um, first of all, I wanted to clarify, because my understanding is this is state-funded. This is a state funded program. Correct. So this doesn't come out of the county's budget for stuff that we're already doing. Um, and I wanted to ask you, are the people that are are being interviewed for this program, uh, is this um, specifically targeting uh, to reduce uh, the involvement with child wel welfare and juvenile justice, or would you consider these families to be on the edge of homelessness? Um, and are you, is there a, a strong interview process? Because it seems like there's just such, it's such an opportunity. It's like a scholarship program, uh, and not very many, not, not very many people can qualify. Um, yeah. So, and many people could want to jump on board, but may not take it seriously and really use it as a leg up. So, I'm just curious to know if you can describe the qualifying process around it. Yeah, so there will be an extensive interview process, and I can certainly um, MEF if, if they can provide more details. But to, to one of the questions in there, um, yes, we want to decrease involvement 
of African American and Native children living in the, these zip codes with our system. Uh, these are the zip codes where there's the highest representation. And these are families that are living with, in high rates of poverty across all the zip codes. And there's that conflation between poverty and neglect. Sometimes people call on families because uh, there's a, a seven-year-old watching a five-year-old and something happens, right? That family could not afford childcare and the parents had to go to work, right? So that gets called into us. If we can provide this, base, this you know, uh, guaranteed income to allow them to get childcare, we're not gonna get the calls. So that's our hope. When we address deep poverty, when we address social determinants of health, we will see decreased, impact, de decreased contra contact with the child welfare system. Yeah, okay, so you know, I, I realize, you know, we've, we've been down so many roads, you know, we, we spend so much money uh, and we, you know, one of the questions was, is this a proper use of taxpayer dollars? But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're already spending millions of dollars cleaning up our parkway, drug rehab, mental health, homelessness, homeless shelters, capital improvement for homeless shelters, wraparound services for people who have already fallen into a situation where it's not that easy to climb out. Um, you know, it's just not. Yeah. And, um, and this is one of the things that crossed my mind when we were early on in COVID and we were talking about uh, you know, a moratorium on evictions. And I was saying, you know, why don't you, instead of saying they don't have to pay their rent, give them rent because you're disrupting the economics of, the economics of this. There are landlords who actually rely on that income, so you're disrupting others. And so the idea of, you know, potentially finding a way to give, um, you know, I think the name guaranteed income is not a proper name for this program, personally. I think it's way more than that. It's, uh, it's, it's like uh, income, but it's also services. And as you uh, told me in my briefing, it's like uh, there's gonna be training, budget yeah. training, and there's gonna be all kinds of um, education and yeah. services and support, so that hopefully at the end of that year of that extra income, they're ready, they've taken it, really taken, planned it out and taken advantage of it. Um, I'm gonna support it uh, because I think if, you know, we, uh, we've, we have a lot of criticism that we're not fixing this problem that we have and it just keeps getting worse. And I'm, you know, my hope is that um, this will be a bridge you know, God gives us grace every day, mm -hmm. um, and maybe this is grace. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I just I, I want to, uh, yeah, I'm I'm a little bit nervous about the word guaranteed income because mm -hmm. how do you decide who gets it and w what's fair about that? This is a pilot program, uh, and uh, it's way more than that word, the, yeah. that concept, that name is not right, but. But I am going to support the pilot because I think um, I'm hoping it'll bring good things to some families. I appreciate that. And it's the Family First Economic Stability Program. Support. Family First Economic Support Program will be the official name. Oh, did they change it since the other well, day? Well, it's a guaranteed income pilot, but we, were, we are calling this one locally the Family First Economic oh. Support Program. Um, that's the, better. All, all this has Thank to you. be, all our materials have good. to be submitted far ahead of time. So we have okay. late uh, developments often. Yeah, this the, is just kind of like uh, one different angle to a huge dilemma. Yes. That's yes. going to take us probably a couple decades or more to climb out of. So, yeah, for sure. And, you know, there are so, so many complex issues. One single strategy isn't going to address them all. Um, so I appreciate the comment. We are spending a lot of money. And when you see that 50% of, of foster youth exit into homelessness, like yeah. keep them out of foster care in the first place, right. strengthen families, invest in families up front. 
Okay, that's all I see from the board. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the board? We do, we have three public comments. Thank you. Our first public comment is Steve Wirtz. Good morning. Uh, I'm gonna start by putting my overhead up. Let's see which direction it goes. You're fine. All right. Um, my name is Steve Wirtz. Uh, good morning, Chair and Supervisors. I'm here to speak in favor of the proposed guaranteed income proposal with its new name. <laughs> um, by profession, I'm a developmental psychologist um, and a research scientist for over 25 years working at the California Department of Public Health, uh, currently with the Office of Policy and Planning. I'm also currently the first five Sacramento uh, commissioner and chair of the first five evaluation committee and a member of the prevention cabinet. Uh, as a research scientist, you would expect me to come up here normally and start giving you some of the data that supports this program. But uh, as a good communication strategist, I've also understood that um, I need to address some of the emotional and values aspects of this issue up front. So first, as most of you are uh, already know, um, you can feel very comfortable that Sacramento County is not the first to try this approach. This map here shows, um, it's potentially out of date, but uh, shows at least uh, 50 of the programs uh, around the country. In California, there are pilots underway in LA, San Diego, Oakland, and of course, Stockton Seeds program. Also, you understand that this would be the fourth United Way project in Sacramento County, uh, the second one being funded by the city of Sacramento, Cohort 2, and Supervisor Cerna and Kennedy uh, were um, used part of the American Rescue Plan Act funds to support uh, cohort three. This pilot would be the fourth. Uh, in addition, as Michelle mentions, the California Department of Social Services is spending $35 million on the foster care and, parent and pregnancy programs. Uh, even uh, President Nixon had proposed a guaranteed income in 1969, and it almost became reality. So although still very innovative, we are on very safe uh, footing to proceed. Second, I want to address the one potential negative um, stigma related to GI type cash transfers by emphasizing that uh, something that you all just mentioned, that the county government has the opportunity through this program to support individual agency and control. All people value freedom and the ability to exercise autonomy over their own lives and generally are responsible and competent and know what they need. Like us, people face pov facing poverty um, and economic hardship are often hardworking and capable when they have a level of economic uh, stability. They are thus empowered to choose how best to meet the needs of their families without conditions or work Mr. Words, can you please wrap up uh, your comments? requirements. As was shown earlier in the slide, the research shows that they spend their money the similar way as uh, you or I. Now, I would ask for a bit more time to put one other slide up at least, um, which is to show the underlying um, uh, mechanism through which uh, we expect these, these projects to work. Um, generally speaking, you can uh, see that we're reducing stress, and it has a number of uh, mechanisms through de decreasing uh, parental stress and conflict to um, improving community and uh, level safety and so on. So if you have a chance to look at that um, a little bit more. But finally, just in terms of the evidence, there are hundreds of articles. I brought several here that document um, the value here. I don't have time to go through those, obviously, as you've pointed out. But in summary, the research shows that these programs produce numerous benefits, lower, lower poverty, debt and crime, better nutrition and health care, fewer underweight babies, boosted school attendance and test scores, higher earnings and savings, stronger local economy, less domestic violence, improved mental health, and I want to stress the, so, the child welfare piece. Quickly, as, please. As well. <laughs> the, uh, Alaska has run the permanent oil 
fund program for years, for 25 years or so. $1,000 in early childhood uh, money reduces referrals for child neglect and physical abuse by the age of three by 10 and 30% respectively. Um, and then the earned income tax... Um, you you, you got to wrap it up, Dr. Okay, the earned income tax credit uh, program using data from the ch children's de data network shows that family income during the first year of life significantly reduces involvement in the child welfare system, and it has long-lasting changes in household stability. And I could address uh, Dr. Cerna's, or Cer uh, Chair, <laughs> Supervisor Cerna's questions if you uh, gave me a moment, but. Well, I, I've already let you go on I understand. tremendously I, longer because of your role on the uh, first five. I, I thought that was appropriate, so I thank you for coming. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good day, Board of Supervisors. My name is Adria Okoro from United Way California Capital Region. First, wanted to thank you all for taking meetings with us these past couple of weeks. And for those who we haven't met yet, yeah, you're, you're next in line. So we're reaching out to you and your staff. And so I wanted to thank you for your investment of guaranteed income. Just wanted to briefly um, share with you all our data brief from um, our third cohort of guaranteed income and wanted to make that available to you all. And just to help to make the nexus between guaranteed income and preventing homelessness and unsheltered homelessness within our communities, a University of Southern California study found that in just six months, they were able to drastically reduce unsheltered homelessness by 15%. And so it's a very um, quick, reasonable fix to support our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Flo, I think that was meant to be handed out, not necessarily projected. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll grab it. <laughs> okay. Mr. Rodriguez? It's a wonderful folder, though. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I'm Davi Rodriguez. Um, and uh, I'd like to say this is a, definitely a lofty goal, even have a noble purpose. However, I would direct you to um, Article 17, Section 3 of the state's constitution, which states, no money shall ever be appropriated or drawn from the state treasury for the purpose or benefit of any corporation, association, asylum, hospital, or any other institution not under the exclusive management and control of the state as an institution. It goes on to list what the exceptions are to that rule, and it's basically um, for the support of minor orphans, half orphans, abandoned children, children of a father who is incapacitated by permanent physical injury, suffering from tuberculosis, needy blind persons, etc. It doesn't list that, uh, I think in general, this program falls so far outside of those boundaries that it would be illegal. And, um, like I said, it's a noble purpose, but this, our state constitution is a restriction on this body and the state legislature. Uh, this section of the constitution has been in there for a long, long time. I believe that people have lost faith in the welfare system, but the problem lies there. We should address that, not try and go off on our own and try and fix this. Uh, with some program that is outside the boundaries of that controlling document. I urge you to first research that section of the Constitution before we drift off and, and, and break it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. We have any, any others, members of the public? No, Chairperson, that's it. Supervisor Cerna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if there's no further public comment, sounds like there isn't, um, and no further discussion by the board, I'd like to move the item. Enthusiastic second. Unanimous vote. For item 43, I do want to point out that you received additional material at the dais, it's also been published. 
This is the Antelope North subdivision, a general plan amendment, specific plan amendment, rezone, large lot tentative subdivision map, small lot tentative subdivision map, and a design review for a property located at 7907 Antelope North Road in the Antelope community. The environmental document is an addendum to the final environmental impact report. All right. Good morning, Chair Kennedy, members of the board. Emma Patton here to present the Antelope North subdivision project for you this morning. I also want to note that I'm joined today by the project manager, Emma Carrico, as well as staff from DOT, should you have any questions that are best answered by them. The project site is located at 7907 Antelope North Road. It's at the northwest corner of Antelope North Road and Poker Lane in the Antelope community. The site is currently vacant with a seasonal creek traveling north-south along the western portion of the site. The site is located within the East Antelope Specific Plan in the Specific Plan Central Sub-Area. The Central Sub-Area was planned to tra transition from agricultural residential to urban residential land uses to promote the logical urban development throughout the Specific Plan Sub-Areas. The subject property is currently zoned RD7, RD20, and open space, and is surrounded by agricultural residential to the north and west, light industrial to the east, and a mix of commercial, industrial, and some vacant property to the south. The existing zoning specific plan land use designation and general plan land use designations were established in 2007 when the board approved the Entercom project. This was a project that was previously proposed on this project site. The project included a tentative map uh, to divide the property into, uh, including the RD20 portion, into 301 single family residential lots. While the zoning and land use designations were established by this action, the map ultimately expired. So that brings us to today with this new proposal, the Antelope North subdivision. The applicant requests a general plan amendment, a specific plan amendment, a rezone, a large lot map, a small lot map, and a design review. I'm gonna go into greater detail on each of these requests in the slides to follow. So as I mentioned, the Entercom project established the property's current zoning and land use designations. The Antelope North subdivision does require the reconfiguration of these zoning districts and land use designations. Uh, only the boundaries will change, but the overall acreage of each of the districts and land use designations would remain the same. These changes would be implemented through the proposed general plan amendment, community, specific plan amendment, and rezone requests. The applicant is requesting both a large lot map and a small lot map. The large lot map would divide the property into two large lot par parcels, one being the multifamily parcel and the other including the remaining portion of the project area. This map would allow for the phasing and financing of the ultimate development. The small lot map would divide the 40.5 acre property into 171 single family residential lots, one 5.1 acre multifamily lot, one open space lot, two frontage lots, and one remainder lot, as shown on this slide. The map would also include the abandonment of several on-site easements where new easements and right-of-ways would be obtained based on the proposed street and lotting pattern. Those would be dedicated as provided in the project's conditions of approval. Access to the subdivision would be from Antelope North Road via A Street and Poker Lane via both C Street and Lewis Avenue. And the internal circulation within the subdivision would have a grid pattern for ease of navigation. Staff and the applicant also work together to allow the subdivision street to front onto the open space to allow future residents to enjoy the open space corridor as a visual amenity and enhance safety and security by maintaining that visual access throughout. You'll also notice here uh, that Lewis Avenue, the westernmost street in the subdivision, includes a court. Due to concerns about, from new, about new residents utilizing the private roads to the north to access to the subdivision, a barricade is proposed at the end of Lewis Avenue uh, at the subdivision's northernmost boundary to keep traffic from accessing these privately maintained roads. 
For safety and circulation purposes, there will be a Knox box proposed at the barricade to allow through access for emergency services. Um, but as shown, Lewis Avenue will terminate in a court to easily accommodate pedestrian or uh, turning vehicle vehicles for uh, those residents accessing their, their homes here. On this aerial exhibit, the blue represents the proposed extension of Lewis Avenue within the project boundary, whereas the red represents the existing portion of Lewis Avenue that is privately maintained, and the green represents the existing portion that is public. Also on the topic of circulation, uh, the project would require the realignment of Antelope North Road. As currently built, Antelope North Road heads south from Placer County line uh, for approximately 0.9 miles, at which point it takes a start, sharp turn to the west, uh, requiring those traveling on Antelope North Road to quickly reduce their speed to navigate that turn. The East Antelope specific plan has identified the need for the Antelope North Road to be widened and realigned in order to accommodate the increased circulation um, as areas within the specific plan surrounding Antelope North Road develop. Uh, to accommodate the additional trips planned to be generated uh, by the proposed subdivision, the project would be required to uh, widen Antelope North Road to a 72-foot arterial roadway and realign it consistent with the guidance of the specific plan and our Sacramento County improvement standards. Also on the topic of circulation changes, uh, I will note that there is an existing circulation break on Poker Lane. It's approximately 0.3 miles west of the project site. This relates to the document that was passed out to you moments ago. Uh, the circulation break on Poker Lane was put in place around 2001, along with the development of the East Antelope Woods subdivision, which is located at the southwest corner of the intersection of Cook Rayola Road and Poker Lane. The break was intended to prevent circulation from the, that urban residential western sub area into the agricultural residential central sub area where this project is located. Um, however, it was always the intent of the specific plan that as development occurs within the, uh, within the specific plan uh, that that break would eventually be removed. Uh, with that being said, the specific plan didn't identify a specific trigger for when that development would require for the, the circulation break to be removed. Um, so to that effect, our Department of Transportation required a roadway connectivity study for Poker Lane, uh, analyzing traffic volumes and signal warrants on Poker Lane under a, a couple of scenarios. Uh, we recently received that, that study. DOT took a look at it, and based on their review, uh, they've determined that the removal of the public street termination and installation of, roadway connect, of the roadway connection on Poker Lane and the associated signal improvements at Poker Lane and Antelope North would be required. So therefore, DOT is requesting a revisions to conditions 68, 69, 92, and 93, as provided on the document that you just received. Uh, essentially, uh, the proposal is to remove the language reading, if warranted by the roadway connect connectivity study, as we have since received that study and determined that those, those improvements are warranted. Our environmental review team prepared a environmental addendum to the prior Entercom project environmental impact report for the proposed project. The addendum concluded that the, the proposed project would not result in new significant impacts not already analyzed under the Entercom EIR. A project specific mitigation monitoring and reporting program was prepared based on the analysis of the addendum. This project was brought to the DRAC and the CPAC for their review and consideration. The DRAC recommended that the board find the project in substantial compliance with the countywide design guidelines, while the CPAC made no formal recommendation. Uh, staff did bring this project to the CPAC twice, and in both instances, neighboring property owners voiced concerns related to traffic and drainage issues. Um, as noted, staff has worked with the applicant to address the traffic concerns as well as the drainage concerns through analysis and conditions of approval to confirm that the project would comply with the county's transportation and drainage requirements. 
the Planning Commission later considered this project on January 8th, 2024. Commissioners had a number of questions surrounding the vehicular circulation, including questions about the Lewis Avenue connections, as well as the room, uh, p potential removal of the circulation break at Poker Lane. Following deliberations, the Planning Commission members in attendance unanimously voted to recommend approval to the board. So based on staff's analysis of the project and the recommendations received from the advisory body, staff is recommending approval of the project. Specifically, staff recommends that you determine the previously certified intercom final EIR together with the CEQA addendum is adequate and complete, that you adopt the mitigation monitoring and report, reporting program, approve the resolution to amend the general plan related to the land use designations, approve a resolution to amend the East Antelope specific plan related to the land use designations, adopt a rezone ordinance, approve the large lot tentative subdivision map, approve the small lot tentative subdivision map, including the abandonments of portions of on-site easements, and find the project in substantial compliance with the countywide design guidelines. Um, that concludes my presentation. As I mentioned, Department of Transportation is available should you have any questions, best answered by them. And we also have the applicant team in attendance this, evening, this morning. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Nope. Uh, Supervisor Hume. Thank you, Chair, and I apologize. This is not my district, so I don't know if it's uncouth to, uh, to comment on this plan in, in detail, but I've spent half my life almost in land use, and so I can't let this go by without calling attention to something, and that is that the, the Lewis uh, Avenue extension with the bulb um, is not likely to ever be punched through. And the reason being is because that the, those semi-rural parcels uh, to the north, the feasibility and economics of cobbling them together in order to densify that and then get the condition to connect those uh, roads uh, is not likely to ever happen. And if it were to ever to be proposed, those new 17 residents now living on what is, is has a cul-de-sac, essentially, are going to come out in force to, to oppose it. And, and so um, I just think this could have been put together, and I'm not laying at this at the feet at planning or at the applicant. It's just we can spit in one hand and wish in the other, and I can guarantee you which one's going to fill up first. And so in the reality, this plan would have been better to sort of recognize that that northern area is not going to densify in a way that would uh, tie into this plan, move that bulb down to the drainage easement area, take that lot 17, and you get an extra lot there uh, going across. So I just say those things just to throw them out there. I don't know that we're going to do anything with it, but I think this plan as presented does not present a realistic future. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none. Uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, well, first of all, is the applicant uh, going to make a presentation or? Good morning, Mr. Chair, Supervisors. Greg Bardini with Morton Batalo Engineering. Uh, would just like to say I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'll add that while the application has a general plan amendment and rezone, it's not changing the areas, it's just changing the configuration to a more regu regular shape. Um, I think staff did a good job with the presentation. Uh, we respectfully ask that you follow the uh, recommendations of the Planning Commission and staff uh, and recommend approval. We've re reviewed the uh, conditions in our agreement along with the amended conditions uh, and we are available for any questions. Great, thank you, sir. Seeing none from the board, do we have any public comment? We do not. Okay, then we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Supervisor Frost. Uh, yes, I understand that it's a situation that is going to be controversial. I think it's already, uh, you know, a little bit controversial, although the CPAC was basically uh, undecided. I think it was a two to two vote. Um, I know we're not voting on, you know, opening those roads at this time, and I know that when that comes, it's going to be controversial. Um, but at the same time, it would relieve a lot of pressure, you know, and create access to areas of the community that people don't have. So it would, there will come a time when it is, it's like a relief valve, I think. And it may change before it comes because I'm, and I may be gone by that time. 
Um, but for what we're doing today, I'm going to go ahead and um, make a motion that we uh, approve, that we um, move the staff's recommendations. Second. For clarification, who's the second? Okay. <laughs> and seconded by Supervisor Serna. Thank you. Whoops. There we go. Unanimous vote. <laughs> Okay, for item 44, adopt the regionally coordinated homelessness action plan and authorize the Department of Homeless Services and Housing to enter into a memorandum of understanding demonstrating support of the regionally coordinated homelessness action plan, submit an application to the California Interagency Council on Homelessness for funding through homelessness, uh, excuse me, homeless housing assistance and prevention grant round five uh, and accept funding in the amount of $12.8 million. Great. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Kennedy, members of the board. I'm Emily Halkin, your director of the Department of Homeless Services and Housing. And I'm here today with our collaborative partners in the city of Sacramento, Sacramento Steps Forward, and SHRA to present the Regionally Coordinated Homelessness Action Plan, or what we affectionately call the RCHAP, um, to seek, and to seek your approvals associated with an application for state funding for HAP Round 5 um, to support initiatives here at the county. The RCHAP builds off uh, the Local Homelessness Action Plan, or the LHAP, which the board adopted in 2022 and established community -wide, a community-wide strategic framework on how we work together to address homelessness. Our overall goal moving into the RCHAP remains the same, which is to transform our system of care from one that focuses on crisis response to one that focuses on increasing access to permanent housing, both to move people out of homelessness, but also prevent folks from entering homelessness. And with the completion, the soon to be completed uh, 2024 point in time count, we'll soon have some new numbers which will inform what we call the gaps analysis and allow us to put some more targeted numbers behind these interventions. How much quantities of outreach efforts, sheltering and housing that we need to help move towards what we're hoping to be a more trans formed system. The RCHAP also builds off of some system level measures that were first established in the LHAP, as shown here. Um, the system level measures also align with system performance standards that our community is held to by the federal and state funders. And as with the LHAP, the community's primary focus moving forward in the RCHAP is on two primary measures, reducing the numbers of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness by 20% and increasing the rate of exits from homeless serving programs into permanent housing to a rate of 42%. In addition to serving as our community's action plan to prevent and end homelessness, the RCHAP is also a very important required component of our funding application to the state for HAP Round 5 funding. The state's guidance for this application was released at the end of September, with applications due in just a couple of weeks at the end of March, which gave communities just about six months to put together what really is a very detailed strategic planning document. And despite this timeline, um, we worked very diligently um, together to engage the community in developing and building out the RCHAP. And this slide details the five public meetings where almost 250 people engaged with us to help develop this RCHAP. I should say this is in addition to many, many meetings and um, conversations we had in the context of the continuum of care. You may remember, for those of you um, who were here when we approved the LHAP, that it was grounded under six strategic solutions. And our RCHAP, or the recommendations to the RCHAP, similarly is grounded, but this time under eight strategic uh, solution areas. The changes in the RCHAP really aren't significant um, in, in terms of adding. What we're doing is pulling outreach out as its own strategy. During the LHAP, it was nestled under coordinated access and separating out rehousing and permanent supportive housing as two distinct strategies to help move people out of homelessness and prevent, home, prevent homelessness. Um, additionally, you'll remember that the LHAP contained a strategy that was specific around access to behavioral health services. The RCHAP ex continues this, but is expanding it to recognize there's other integration of services and systems that we need to work on, such as employment services, education, adult and child welfare, et cetera. 
So these eight solutions are detailed in the RCHAP, which is attached to your board letter, and really are intended to set a strategic framework over the next three to five years. And as the county and our partners work towards new programs and new funding initiatives, we will certainly be orienting all of our recommendations to the board under these solutions and are committed as a department and as a county to measuring the success of all of the programs that you've invested in and aligning them under our work under the RCHAP. The RCHAP also contains a one-year action plan, which is Appendix 1 to the RCHAP, and it details specific actions that the community expects to achieve in the first year of the plan, which will roughly align with the upcoming fiscal year. Many of these actions are already underway, um, and the next two slides just highlights a few of the key change initiatives we're recommending for the first year. Um, I also do want to underscore that some of these actions are exploratory in nature, laying some groundwork which, for, what, for what we believe will be new transformative work. So year one might be laying the groundwork and subsequent years might be implementing some of these new initiatives. I'm not going to read all of these, but just want to highlight one or two, but happy to um, address any of the ones that are on the slide or the ones that are in, in the handout as well. The two on this that I wanted to lift to the board's attention um, is that we are looking to explore the applicability to Sacramento of developing a concerted street to housing pilot. Um, this is an approach that's been used in many communities. Houston stands out, I believe Denver is doing this, to both try to address the impacts of unsheltered encampments by reorienting a lot of the services, rehousing services, benefit services, um, community engagement services, right in the encampment and rehousing people straight out of, of encampment versus going through sheltering programs first. Again, our, our, our request for first, the first year really would orient this and, and to develop a framework for how this might work in Sacramento. The second one I want to lift up from this slide is um, something that's really critical and we've realized through our work um, implementing the coordinated access system is that we have a shelter and rehousing system that is not equipped to support some of our most vulnerable folks. We're seeing people trying to access shelter and housing who have very high levels of behavioral health but more importantly medically, medical needs that the shelter system can't um, can accommodate. And so we want to start thinking about um, how we can identify new ways to shelter and ultimately rehouse those folks who have medical fragilities that, that can't be accommodated in some of our, our current system. Um, the two I wanted to lift up on this slide um, is I think we've, uh, the RCHAP also, in addition to building off the LHAP, all the acronyms in the world, um, also um, aligns with the affordable housing plan, which the board adopted um, in October. And so many of the strategies that we're really excited about are about increasing our focus on housing, not just new housing, but also the quantity and efficacy of many rehousing programs we have. The county administers some, certainly the COC does, and SHRE is a critical partner too. And so really committing to looking at how we can improve of efficacy of existing rehousing programs and making them more accessible to the folks who are experiencing homelessness. And then the final one here I wanted to lift up is a, a companion piece that you'll see as an attachment to the RCHAP are some recently adopted community standards. Um, they were adopted by the Continuum of Care Board this fall. They are required by the federal government. And really what they do is they seek to provide consistency across programs so that Anybody entering a shelter, whether it's city funded, county funded, privately funded, is getting the same access to resources and the same experience. Um, and so we created standards to help um, develop what the expectations are. But key to ensuring that these standards are met is really providing the backbone support to our CBOs, our community-based organizations running these programs. So we've, we've lifted that up as a key um, component for year one. Finally, the RCHAP also serves, as I said at the beginning, our community's application for our HAP funding round five. And while today's actions are specific to the approximately $12.8 million that the county will be receiving, we wanted to roll up and show you the impact that HAP has had on the community since its inception in 2019. Um, so this pie chart summarizes the totality of HAP funds that have come to the Sacramento region, about $173 million come, has come to the county, the COC and the City of Sacramento um, since 2019 and where they've been invested. 
As you can see, most of these investments have gone to what the state calls interim housing or sheltering programs. But I do want to underscore that these categories um, sometimes don't have the nuance. Almost all of our sheltering programs we've invested in also come up with intensive wraparound case management, connections to behavioral health, and rehousing support. So these categories are not as mutually as exclusive as they might appear on a pie chart. Okay, just to be oh. clear on that, go back, go back. Sure. Yeah, sorry. So just to be clear on that particular point, so all of the the services that we provide through this program that weren't necessarily captured because it wasn't directly HAP funding. Uh, no, uh, what I meant to say is that if we fund something in HAP that is called shelter in the in the state's world, the entirety of that contract is called sheltering even if that shelter contract includes um, intensive case management, rehousing supports, which they all do. Now, the thing that's not captured, which I think you're also pointing to, is all those connections to behavioral health that are right. leveraged as, as a result of the HAP. So th that, that por portion, that's not captured here. That is so not. This is just the HAP funds. Above and beyond. Correct. Thank you. Um, in terms of HAP 5, the county's recommendation for our $12.8 million is shown here. Um, again, most of the funding we're recommending will be used to sustain existing HAP commitments that you've made over the years. And those include the expansion that was made a few years ago of our scattered site sheltering program, um, the funding you've committed to our multidisciplinary outreach teams, and some of our key youth serving programs that we started um, in 2019 and are continuing to support. The balance of funding for HAP 5 is recommended to support the new safe stay sheltering operations. This would include running the shelters, but all those um, auxiliary services that come with it. Today, we're seeking your approval to, for the board uh, for these broad funding categories, and we will be returning to you with specific projects and contracts for approval as we are spending down Existing HAP dollars first, um, it's anticipated that these funds will start to be incorporated into contracts in fiscal year 25-26, but we'll be returning to you as those funds start to come to play. And, and you're, you put in the pot for each one of these categories. Uh, you came to these numbers based upon our experience over the last couple of years in, in doing essentially this work. So this isn't a, you know, we're not throwing a dart at the wall. We actually are basing this on data that we've got from our past experience. Yeah, so a few of these things are, are mandated. So for example, the youth set aside is mandated. Admin is, I mean, I guess you don't have to take your admin, but we do need to administer these, those things. The HMIS set aside, the system support. But in the bigger buckets around the services, yes, a good majority of that is going to sustain existing programs at which we've been operating, and then the rest are working to align with board priorities and things we've already sort of set in motion. Thank you. Um, so finally, the approvals, the specific approvals we're seeking from you today are to approve the RCHAP itself, to approve our funding recommendations for the HAP5 application, to authorize staff to develop the balance of the application. The RCHAP is the bulk of it, but there's some other documents we have to put together for the state, which does include an MOU that must be signed by the county, the city, and the COC, and also to approve receipt of the funding upon award by the state. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions, and our partners are here as well if you have questions for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emily. And we've had uh, we had some discussions about the RCHAP during our, our two-by-four with our, our city colleagues uh, last week and also at the Homeless uh, Policy Council meeting on Friday. Um, but I've had a little more time to think about it, so I want to ask you a couple things. First, with that street-to-housing thing you mentioned, and I know you're going to be fleshing this out more and, and researching it. What are some things you've, you're seeing in other cities that we might be able to implement here, say, in conjunction with yeah. one of our safe state communities? I'm just curious what that would look, could look like. Yeah, so myself and Lisa and then Ben from the city attended a conference in D.C. a few months ago now where the consultants who did this for Houston presented it. And some of the um, key key parts of that it really was a shift where the, the community, this is Houston in particular, decided to, to make targeted investments um, where they took teams of folks and said, okay, this is the camp you're going into. There's 10 people on day one. You're going to stay in that camp until every single person has been offered a housing opportunity. And then we're going to house them all. And those who 
don't say yes, we'll move on. And then the camp, the physical camp will close down as well. So it really requires a concerted effort, not just of the service side, but also street management teams. You know, your, your roadway folks, your law enforcement folks. It also um, uh, removes some of the barriers that often are presented for folks to access housing. You don't have to go into the housing office to apply. We're going to come to you. You don't have to go and get your documents, go downtown and take a bus. So it really is recognizing the fact that um, when given options to, to directly be housed versus going into a series of shelters or other types of programs, um, folks will say yes. And I think that the um, one of the, the driving forces behind some of the communities has been saying, and to the community, when we do this, that camp's gone, and it's not coming back. And we're committed to, to the back end, too, right? We're committed to, like, once everybody's been offered an opportunity and they've moved on, we're going to physically manage this physical space in a very different way. I always appreciate you throwing that in, Emily, because I think it's always important to keep that in mind, you know, the, the impacts, uh, larger impacts of encampments and communities. Okay, well, that, that's very interesting. I, I, uh, it sounds like we'll need to... You know, the success of that would also be contingent on having enough space and enough capacity and kind of being probably yes. nimble, you know, which the county isn't always nimble. <laughs> yeah, and I should say that the, the successful programs don't just sort of re reshuffle the deck. They do reshuffle the deck. You know, out outreach workers become housing re re workers, but it also commits resources to that very end. Like, we're, we're not going to rely on waiting in line for the next housing opportunity. We're going to fund, have a a blanket fund that can can do really um, creative ways of maybe funding a double deposit or, or paying your rent for a, a concerted amount of time. So it's not it's not funding neutral, um, but it's additive, but also re re realigning some of your existing resources. Okay. And next question: the um, you know you mentioned on on the solutions how in the LHAP. And I'm looking at Lisa here, too, because we've had this discussion. Um, one of the things that was a specific solution in the LHAP was behavioral health uh, resources. And now it's kind of been, uh, it, that's been rolled into the integrated services. And I know behavioral health, it's, it's not only is it one of the complex causes of homelessness, a cause, but also an important um, um, uh, intervention for people as well. I mean, it, it's, it's so, there's so much intersection between the housing and the behavioral health resources. But I think it, you know, in my opinion, this is not going to stop me supporting the RCHAP, but I just think by folding it into the larger integrated services, it, it, we lose a little of the prioritization, I think, of, of really calling out behavioral health resources. Um, just a, really kind of a comment, um, because I, I think we really need to highlight it both as, again, as a cause and highlight the, all the work that we are doing in the county um, to help people with any behavioral health needs, um, including substance use uh, and addiction services. So just a, a, a comment on that. And then in terms of the, in this RCHAP, one of the, I think, really important components of a local plan and now a regional plan is to have objective measures of success. Can you... Describe that a little bit. I know it's not, you know, in your presentation today, but how will it evolve to really develop tangible measurements and and uh, strategies for for how we address things that are working well, things that are that are, that are not working. How are we going to both measure that and and act on it? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So there are, I just sort of glossed over the system measures that are embedded in here. And so there's a, a series of seven or eight of them. Um, and I highlighted the two most critical, oh, I can't get back. I highlighted the two most critical, but they're not by any means the only ones. So we, um, you know, part of the RCHEP also is holding ourselves accountable to annual, probably even more frequently reports. And Lisa may want to weigh on, on the frequency of that too. I can't recall. Um, but each, um, thanks Flo, each strategy has... Um, action items which have a lead and it has outcomes and it has um, timelines and it has this is I mean it has expected um, measurables for us to deliver at the project level but then at the system level everything's supposed to roll up to these seven um, high, high level system level measurements and so this is the point I was trying to make earlier is as we bring new investments it's incumbent us to say okay board we're asking for this new investment this one aligns with the outcome of this and we anticipate seeing this this level of change based on your investment not sure if that's getting exactly no, that, to your that, question that's, that's helpful and will there kind of be um, a, a dash is there already a dashboard Lisa where you people can kind of track our, our progress as we're going along 
I don't think there's a dashboard, but Lisa, if you want to speak to how you report out, that'd be great. Thank you, Lisa Bates with Sacramento Steps Forward. Um, currently, we uh, have the quarterly reports for the LHAP on our uh, website. And so what we would envision is with the RCHAP, we would also be producing quarterly reports that could evolve into a dashboard, but uh, for the moment would probably be reports. The other thing I would like to add is in addition to the system level measures and and Emily touched on it, is that we're trying to also come forward in the summer with um, metrics and information around all the programmatic activity because your programs add up to then what's going to be effective at the system level. So we're starting to build some consistency in terms of reporting on how well are our shelters doing, how well are our rehousing efforts doing, and, and having um, consistent metrics that are applied. So that information will also start to be um, shared out as part of this process come summertime. Great. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because the, the um, I think measuring those successes, and, and we kind of talked about this a little bit at the uh, um, Homeless Policy Council the other day. Um, I, I brought up something that I think is extremely important is to measure how long it takes for someone to be in coordinated access enrolled until they actually get into a shelter bed. We, we need to be measuring that because ideally we'd be in a situation where someone would be able to get you know, treatment on demand or right into a shelter right away because we always have enough capacity for that. So I think measuring the efforts that this board is taking to establish more shelter capacity and more behavioral health, you know, inpatient capacity and how that is impacting our ability to get people directly off the streets and into a program is, is really, really important. Um, so I appreciate it. But just as important also is how long people are spending in shelters before they are able to get into uh, some more permanent housing um, solution, of course. So measuring both those things, I think, are, are really important. Um, and I think I will stop there. So this will supplant the LHAP. The LHAP will go away. It'll just be this. Okay. Yeah, yeah this will take, take the place of the LHAP. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Hume. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me preface my comments by saying I fully recognize that this is the manifestation of the strings that come attached with the funding <laughs> from uh, higher levels of government. And so I do appreciate all of the work both Sacramento Steps Forward and, and your department has, has put into these documents. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, I, I think I've been on record previously as saying I'm not a fan of housing first as a policy. I think it should be housing and. Um, so that's the first thing on, on this page. And then that, that Adherence to that runs throughout this entire document on the system level performance measures. And so for me personally, that's, that's problematic. And I think where it first um, shows itself is, is on the, the vision page, which if this is a ranking and not just a table of contents, I believe that item six and item seven ought to be reversed and so that we're focused on the services before we're focused on the permanent housing solutions. Just to be clear, they are not intended to be ranked. They're in the order that people touch the system. So that was sort of the logic behind the ordering, but they're not intended to be ranked or like put up against each other. So it's to, intended to flow the um, order and then the order that a person would inter intersect with our system. Then my comment still stands. I believe but they I should intersect that. with the supportive services before they are uh, thrown into permanent housing solutions. But then my biggest question is, is this. Um, in the table of contents, uh, you know, which is on page two, this page, references Appendix 3, which talks about the um, community standards implementation and key milestones. And so on page 43, mm -hmm. it talks about the community standards that were adopted by the COC board on December 13th, 2023. Have we ever been, uh, had that document put in front of us for comment and review? Yeah, we have not, and this, is, this has come up. This is something that is typically approved by the COC. It's mandated, but I do understand there's been some questions, and there's a potential, I believe, I don't want to speak for the city, but I think the same question. So there is a potential that we could bring them forward, but they have not come to the, the board or the council. They've gone to the COC board. So I, I, I have a problem with that, and the reason is is because that document guides and informs all of the contracts that will encumber the county with our CPOs and, and how we will get to the street level implementation of this plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and while I respect the work of the COC board, there's not a single elected on that board. And so when we have constituents who 
with their own eyes are using an evidence-based and data-driven approach to say your policies aren't working, and then we have a document, which is right here, and it's a 79-page document uh, that, that informs all of the things that we're going to be doing throughout the life of this RCHAP uh, that may or may not align with what we have been doing. And so I see a lot of this plan as doubling down on policies that clearly don't seem to be working to me. A 300% increase in individuals is not a measure of success. Furthermore, I, I only uh, found, was made aware of this document and that it's, it was kind of embedded in this uh, last night, and so I haven't had a lot of time to review it. But, for example, on page 15, under program access, section I, subsection 3, subsection R, it talks about, uh, uh, I don't know, these, these are, uh, I think, the um, emergency shelter uh, preferences or, or maybe the street outreach preferences. And it says housing first, comma, harm reduction, trauma-informed uh, care, et cetera. Well, in my experience, harm reduction results in things like needle exchanges and open-air drug markets and uh, things that are not good for a healthy community. And so I don't support those at all. Those don't align with my values in any way, shape, or form. And so to have that kind of as a, a little parenthetical in a document that I've never been shown when I'm asked to prove the overarching document, I, I can't wrap my head around that. Furthermore, on page uh, 33, and I think this talks about the emergency shelter provisions, uh, and I'm just picking out some of the little things. Uh, it, it, it's a, a parenthetical E, parenthetical one, parenthetical lowercase e, and it says working on permanent housing as quickly as possible. Now, if that's lowercase permanent housing, I'm on board with that. If we're trying to get them to where they have their dignity, their hope restored, and they're, they're in a, a living situation that is tenable and sustainable, great. If we're talking about uppercase PSH, I don't think all people should be funneled towards that uh, as the, the solution that is the starting point. And so because of those things, and I, I realize we have public comment on this, I cannot vote to adopt this RCHAP today because I don't have enough confidence that it personally aligns with what I think we should be focused on going forward. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, and I think that the very least, if not in public, we can certainly commit myself and Lisa to do a more in-depth briefing with you on the um, community standards, what their intention was, and how we're working to apply them. But I definitely hear you and appreciate that. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question as it relates to both uh, the slide that you have up here but also the pie chart that you showed us earlier that has the, um, the different allocation uh, for the RHAP 5 proposed funding. Um, in the previous slide, it uh, has as one of the aspirational goals increasing permanent housing by 42%. Mm -hmm. So how do, help me reconcile the way that the proposed funding allocations um, would, would occur as it relates to um, proportionality with that, those aspirations of reducing, um, what was it, folks on the street by 20% and permanent housing by 42%, because you look at this and you say, well, okay, only 7% is being right. allocated or uh, appropriated for permanent housing, and 60% is for this interim housing kind of nebulous category. Sure, no, I appreciate that. So um, the 42% is not meant to be 42% of the investments. It's meant to be to improve our exits from the homeless system of care into permanent housing to 42%. It's a little bit wonky to say it, because currently I, don't, I think we're at about 20 to 25% of folks who exit, regardless if it's a shelter, street outreach, transitional housing, or exit of permanent housing. That being said, your point is still, is still valid. And yeah, so, because even if we, we mm -hmm. took that statement, um, you're still showing less than 10% for permanent housing here, but you'd still have 20, 25% uh, gap to fill to get to that metric. Yeah. So, the, and I think maybe when we come with the budget, we can give you a bigger picture because it's just the HAP funding. There's a lot of other investments happening at the county, certainly at the city and the COC level outside of HAP to support those things. That's one. And then the second thing is while the interim housing category is very big, and I do agree with you, um, it's so, somewhat reflective of, of some um, current current needs, at least the interim housing that's all funded by the county includes in those interim housing programs flexible rehousing dollars, um, tenancy 
policy supports, um, connections to housing sustainability services with the intention of moving folks out. But I, I do hear you, Supervisor, we could make a decision and say we want to, to swap some of the HAP funding around to, to serve more permanent housing, whether it be built housing or, or, or subsidy programs. Part of the challenge with HAP, as you know, is it's been continuous one-time funding. So what we funded in 2019, <laughs> by necessity, needs to be funded in 2024, or we close the program down. And so it's somewhat a, um, a, a beast that um, we've, it's difficult to, to unravel without additional funding. And then as it relates to the 10% the, uh, prevention identified on the pie chart here, uh, can you give me some, um, give us some um, detail to that? What, for instance, what does yeah. that include? So I, I can't speak to the cities, but if they may be able to, I can definitely tell in our pie chart, we do a, um, a program with Lutheran Social Services for youth prevention and early intervention, which provides um, access to, to resources and rehousing um, assistance or sustainable, uh, as well as a lot of wraparound services. So that's an example, and we've been funding them since HAP1, um, and they do great outcomes for, for folks, for homeless youth or youth who are precariously housed to sustain them. And oftentimes those are very short-term interventions. Right, um, and so I think the city has similarly funded some prevention programs, as has the COC. But on the chart, though, you actually have called out youth rehousing specifically, um, separate from prevention. So, are, we, are you telling me that all 10% would go to this? That's that's a really good point, and I'm going to ask Yao Yin since you put the pie chart together. Maybe you, oh, or Lisa. Actually, I think the majority of this prevention dollars in the HAP funds is actually come from the COC. So in conjunction with the coordinated access system, we've stood up a problem-solving access program whereby we are trying to identify people who are at, about to be homeless in the next 14 days or, or just became homeless and provide short-term, one-time financial assistance to help bring them back into housing. So the majority of this money that you see here is actually coming from the COC dedicating funds for that for that program, working in conjunction with a number of providers in our community. And the expectation is to continue to build that prevention framework, and that's one of the key actions identified in your RCHAP. So well. is that direct subsidy of people's rents? Yeah, uh, eviction avoidance, um, um, landlord, you know, uh, we actually have in our CAS annual report, which um, is on our website, and I'm sure staff will give you how that money is being used in the community. Right. Thank you. That just reminded me, the county has also uses a portion of our HAP funds for an expungement clinic in partnership with the public defender, which I think would be categorized as this prevention similar to what Lisa, not as big as the COCs, but. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for, let me go back to this. I wanna, I wanna comment on a, and have a few questions on um, Supervisor Hume's points, because I, I I share some of his concerns, and I want to understand this a little better, um, Emily. With the the community standards that are developed, I'm looking. So it's, it looks like it's a requirement of federal law. These funds that we have to develop these community standards. If we pass this RCHAP today, are we adopting every one of those community standards? Because it, it's, I mean, the document says it applies to the LHAP. Are, are we going to be revisiting these community standards? I'm looking at least. I don't know who. I mean, they. Go ahead, Lisa. And I said the, the community standards have already been adopted to Supervisor Hume's request. It may make sense to bring them back to share with you. Um, so the RCHAP in and of itself won't affect that adoption. Okay. However, what it will do, I think, is provide us some direction to, um, to do more work with the providers, to train them up on it, to bring them the resources to make sure they can meet those standards. Um, but they are, they are referenced in here because certainly they're important, but they are a, a separate document. Okay. I, I think it is a, it, it's a very good point that really the, the meat and potatoes behind this thing is, is this, the community standards. I mean, that, that really dictates a lot who can be eligible for the funding that this board approves. And we don't have, elected officials don't have a role in these. Lisa, can you respond to that? So first of all, um, you're correct that this is something that the COC is required to do, set common standards. Um, and they're building off of standards that the county and the city have previously adopted, particularly shelter standards. So we took an eight-month process to convene community um, representation, focus groups, staff, 
uh, looked at best practices across the country, um, and built upon what this community already has in your contracts and um, any standards that may have been adopted. There's also a recognition that this is an iterative document, that it is, it is a live document that will morph and change to, you know, depending on our ability to, to implement it. So it has flexibility built in. It's also recognizing that not everyone may be able to meet the standards day one, and that's okay. And so you all have the contracting authority, and you can choose which of the standards you're going to incorporate or what exceptions you're going to allow. So um, although we've put the standards in place, you're largely the ones that are contracting for most of the funding for the, for the community. And so we um, have acknowledged that we, we, I think it would be fair to say most people want to see some level of standards in our community, some quality and some baseline. But we'd, we also recognize that 95% of the services are community-based organizations. So in some ways, we want to make sure that not only are we um, clear on our standards, but that, that the, that the community-based organizations can also work or strive to meet those standards, even if it's gonna mean over time. So there's a long runway built into these standards as well, recognizing that this is our first start. Um, so I just wanted to make clear that you all have the authority in terms of how you are um, choosing to bring these, these um, standards into your work, but it is our hope that over time that we build that consistency as a community, and certainly we'll be trying to report out. So the more consistency there is around, among programs, so you're comparing apples to apples, that's gonna be important too as, as we move forward with more transparency in terms of how programs are doing. Okay. No, that's very helpful. I really appreciate that. I, and I, I do think that, you know, community standards that were maybe developed over the course of years, um, we also have to look back and see, hey, did we maybe have a little too much rigidity in those standards? Should we, should we, and, and the thing that comes to mind is uh, what, what Supervisor Hume was mentioning, and we, we did hear from some providers about um, the housing, housing first, you know, rigidity, and, and I, and I think if we impose that on every single program, I think we are, are missing an opportunity to serve some people that, that may not do well in that environment. Um, and so let me just ask you that question with the, the housing first. Is that a, a requirement? I've been told that that is an absolute requirement for these HAP dollars because they're federal dollars. Is, is, is that an accurate statement or are there ways to create exceptions and, and fund programs that are an exception to that? Yeah, I'd say most of our external funding, including the state funds, HAP, and the, the federal funds, do require adherence to Housing First. That being said, to Lisa's point, there are contracts that the county administers using other funds, which you, you would have more flexibility on. And I did want to say that um, with the community standards, my staff are already reviewing those in light of our current contracts and planning for upcoming contracts for the next fiscal year and looking at places where we have some differences and how to, to incorporate those into those. So I think the contracting process, and that, to Lisa's point, is, a, is something that the board can certainly weigh in on. Many of our contracts, because they have state and federal funds, right. do, do already um, probably align with 80% of the things in the standards. But there are a few um, that, especially if it's a general funded program, that, that we might want to do a little deeper dive and look at what flexibility we might have. I mean, there, and in the standards buried in one of them, I don't, it'd probably take me a while to find it here. It does, there is a mention of programs that do maybe require sobriety in a place for these kind of subpopulations. So, you know, I, I appreciate that that's in there, but I, I think we have to um, really have a, a, continue to have a conversation about, um, funding some of these these types of programs that don't adhere to this strict you know housing first um, uh, approach and in terms of the harm reduction I think it's also an important point I want to underscore too because there's a huge spectrum everything from you know having Narcan available in schools to uh, to needle exchanges to assisting someone who maybe is using heroin out on the streets and in the latter example I mean I think you saw a lot of that in the city of Sac of San Francisco um, some approaches that are kind of being disavowed by by the city of San Francisco at this point because they went too far so um, harm all harm reduction is not equal um, so I, I think it's important that as these are developed and discussed, that that's part of the discussion. Um, final question, 
is so since this is our chap, what th- will this be then going to? Will you be doing a presentation at all? I know our friends from the from the city of Sacramento are here and, and welcome in these very welcoming chambers. Um, We're headed there at two o'clock. How about the other cities within the county? Will they be getting a presentation on this? Um, so, so the only um, communities who are required to adopt the RCHAP are those receiving HAP funds. So that's ourselves, the City of Sacramento, and the Continuum of Care Board. The Continuum of Care Board will be um, reviewing this tomorrow morning. That being said, the other cities were welcome to the table. Some of them engaged at different levels in the development, but they are not formally adopting that, um, nor do they have to sign on to the MOU as a, as a contingency to submit that, the funding application. We're continuing to work with them, and there's some additional work around how they participate in this region, but the HAP, the HAP funding is not contingent on any of them signing off formally on the RCHAP or the MOU. Okay. And there is certainly is value for those other jurisdictions to, to know about this and understand it, especially as we're going down the road of a some sort of shared, you know, governance structure in, uh, in, in our region. So, okay. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, that was very enlightening, the conversation regarding the COC and the strategy and all that. Um, thank you, Lisa. That So just so that I'm, I just want to probably ask you to repeat, one of you, it doesn't matter. Um, so by adopting this, we're not locking ourselves into the 79-page document that uh, Supervisor Hume referenced. Um, we can, you know, like a smorgasbord, choose what we want out of it or not. You are definitely not locking yourselves into that. I think the place where you can have input is, to Lisa's point, in our contracting process. And so we as staff can certainly bring to you those places where there's differences between our current contracts and the standards and potentially have that conversation as we enter into next fiscal year's contracts. But you're not tying yourself to to the totality of those standards today. I think what you're committing to is is working collaboratively with our community partners to figure out what standards are appropriate and how how to bring resources to our providers so they can meet those standards that we all agree upon. Okay, great. Um, and but it it, it, is, it does reference in in the throughout the document and at the um, in the resolution that we will you know enter into this MOU uh, and it includes with the continuum of care lead. Uh, is that the chair? Um, I don't know who actually signs on your behalf, it's you? Lisa. Lisa <laughs> okay. signs, yeah. Well, that gives me a level of comfort. That's <laughs> yeah. good. Um, so so then. Uh, but, but but we haven't seen this MOU. It hasn't been drafted, but we're being asked to approve an MOU that hasn't been written, right? Yeah, uh, it has been um, drafted and reviewed by county council. It's not attached to the to the board letter in part yeah. because of the quick timing to get this yeah. approved by you and get to the state. Yeah. However, county council and city attorneys have both reviewed it. It's a very, um, and I'm happy to share it once it's finalized. It's, it's pretty high level. I don't... Um, but we can definitely share it with you. But we, in order to keep this on track and not miss the March submittal deadline, we were sort of... I get that. Then my recommendation would be to keep it as high level as possible. At I agree. That point. Okay. Um, great. Do so we have any public comment on this? Oh, and by the way, this isn't a, a conversation necessarily on harm reduction, but since it's been brought up um, specifically uh, a couple of times, um, I, I uh, agree with uh, Supervisor Desmond that harm reduction, when done right, and uh, can be extremely important to our community, and things like needle exchange, which I personally uh, do believe is important. Um, but, you know, I've seen organizations called needle, needle exchange, leaving a box of needles in a bush in a park for people to go get. And I've also seen it responsibly uh, managed in ways that it probably saves many lives. So um, I, I will go on record as being probably more supportive than some of harm reduction programs. Do we have public comment? Okay. Jeff. Um, Jeffrey Tardigia. Jeffrey Tardigia, advocate. Uh, I am here because a previous board member, Don Natoli, and the previous executive director of COC um, said, come, listen, talk with us. And Patrick, I appreciate you reading the documents. There is importance of reading what documents are here going on. Um, I've just resigned from the being the time and point co-coordinator chair on that. Um, I am looking forward to seeing and unfortunately have my doubts that we're going to exceed our 9,000 point in time count that we've had in the past um, just because of other circumstances that occurred. 
But to, to this point, is, is this is a approval here of the next step of what needs to be going on and happening. And I appreciate you looking at quarterly reviews to see what is happening and going on. You might say I've almost spent the last decade of working on point in time to see that we get the numbers accurately and recorded. The other reason I am here on that is that for this is because we need to have law enforcement let COC know what they are doing with mm -hmm. the homeless. When we did this point and count this last time and the previous time, we had between five and 15 camps disappear. They were just gone. So they were unaccounted for. We found some, two or three, but they were not able to be counted. So we have no idea. And you've seen how it has transformed over this decade from going from 3,000 to 6,000 to 9,000. Um, and here we are trying to make a better effort and getting the accountability in uh, about what is going on and happening. And that's my public comment in support of this document and this intention. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. That concludes your public comments. Thank you. Supervisor Frost. I just want to go on record as um, Supervisor Hume's comments resonated with me. I appreciate that there's flexibility. Um, I am um, concerned about voting for something that I haven't seen, the MOU. And so I'm probably not likely to support. Okay, any other comments? All right. Is there a motion? Chair will uh, move staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the motion carries with Supervisor Hume and Frost recording a no vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the work, Emily and staff and Lisa. Thanks. Okay, item 45 is the one year report out on the city and county partnership agreement. Hello again. <laughs> um, Emily Halkin, your director of the Department of Homeless Services and Housing. And Flo, can you pull up the other, or have them pull up the yeah, other? Yeah, thank you. Um, Metro, I'm gonna ask Metro to pull that up for them, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, following up on the RCHAP approval, we're now here again with our partners in the city of Sacramento to share outcomes from our first year implementation of the city and county partnership agreement. It's very opportune that this item is following the adoption of the RCHAP, and we hope that you'll see some of the work that we're doing under this partnership agreement is supportive of the strategic initiatives we just discussed. Um, I do want to stress that while the partnership agreement does not reflect the entirety of what either the city or the county is doing to address homelessness, it does capture some significant collaborations that we continue to enhance and expand upon. I also really want to acknowledge the work of so many staff at the county and the city, some of whom our amazing heart team is here today. Um, they really are demonst have demonstrated at the street level, literally, the collaboration that's called for in this partnership agreement and their daily work to help those living unsheltered in our community, as well as to address the impacts of homelessness that we see throughout our community. But we also want to acknowledge that we have more to do. Um, as we go through the accomplishments of this first year, we're also aiming, of course, to do better every single day and to align this work better with the regional plan that you just adopted. Um, as we discuss some of the outcome data specific to the partnership agreement, we will highlight not only the improvements we've made over the course of this first year, but additional improvements that we're committed to making as we move forward. Um, in your board packet, you have two reports, both of which we're gonna very briefly review. The first one we're gonna go through is actually the second attachment, so our apologies on the ordering there, which is the narrative status report for the second six months of the agreement. And please also note that the six month report is actually seven months um, because the first six month report captured a portion of December of 2022, but we're now moving forward with true six months starting in the year 2024. So the partnership agreement, as you know, holds the city and the county to some specific outcomes that are generally center centered around four main areas, which are shown here. Um, the written report is similarly organized and it has directives from each category that are summarized as well as progress that we showed 
we have shown with a designation of green, yellow, and red coloring to indicate the status of where we're at. Um, in the outreach category, you can see a series of eight or nine um, commitments we have made. We were work to work together to hire and deploy 50 encampment workers in the city of Sacramento. That includes 25 through the city itself, 15 that are funded by our managed care plans, and then 10 behavioral health workers. And these folks were to provide multidisciplinary outreach teams um, throughout the city. Deployment of these teams is at the discretion of the City Department of Community Response, um, and they prioritize which encampments the teams visit. As you can see, they're all green. All of these requirements have been met, and the teams do meet regularly both in the field and to um, talk about planning and strategy. Um, the requirements that we've categorized as services primarily speak to the expansion of access to county behavioral health services for people who are living unsheltered in the city of Sacramento. And as you can see, we've noted all but one of these has been met with the green dot. The one that we have marked yellow or really indicative of still in progress is reflective of some additional work that needs to be done with our managed care partners around increasing capacity within the CalAIM enhanced care management and community support programs. Um, the third category of work that we committed to under the partnership agreement is around sheltering and housing. And as you can see, these are also mostly complete. Um, only a yellow is marked underway related to the city's provision of shovel-ready sites for up to 200 new safe stay beds that would be in the city of Sacramento. As you know, the city and the county are working with the state on the first um, site that is groundbreaking as we speak on Stockton Boulevard and will contain 175 of these 200 beds and we're continuing to work with the city on options for the balance of those units. Um, the final category is around training and information, and as you can see, we continue to work on a few of these. Um, specifically, the city has asked for training on a few county programs, and my staff are working right now with our sister departments um, to provide those in the coming month or two, mostly around how they can better understand some of our benefit programs and some of the programs run out of DCFAS and others. Um, Data sharing is well underway in our shared HMIS database where both the city and the county teams report the majority of our efforts. However, both the city and the county have separate databases that they use to support their individualized work. The city, for example, uses a separate database for some of their encampment and deployment data. And the county, the behavioral health team, of course, uses a separate database for clinical health information. And so we're continuing to work on options of how we can both have better visibility into these sort of um, very specific databases because they do influence the work we do together. Supervisor Serna. Thank you. Um, as it relates to that last, uh, that bottom um, acknowledgement there, the county shall provide city with 5150 train holds. Is that uh, purely for sworn uh, Police officers? Yeah, no. So that, the reason this one is yellow is because this is primarily because this is not for trained officers. It's intended for DCR staff, but currently they don't have clinical staff on, on staff who uh, can do that. I was going to say, how, are they even um, at a place uh, in their professional certification to be able to do that? Right. It's my understanding that currently they can't, which is why we have not done that training. Should DCR start employing clinical staff, we'll, of course, do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this slide just summarizes the previous slide showing the overview of the progress in each of the four categories and noting again the areas where we're continuing to work towards meeting some of the expectations in the partnership agreement. Um, Overall, I just believe, as I think our city partners do, the city and the county teams have really found the partnership agreement to provide a really good framework for our continued collaborations and to enhance our abilities to support those people, the most vulnerable citizens of the city of Sacramento. And now if it's, I'd like to switch to the overhead, if that's okay, Flo, um, and talk a little bit about the second attachment, which is really the first attachment to your board letter. Um, I'm going to focus on the front page. This is attached to your board letter, and I have extra copies if anybody doesn't have one. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to note that the second page of this, if you were to flip it over, has some brief narrative updates on the partnership agreement that are related to behavioral health, sheltering, affordable housing, and our coordinated access system. Happy to go into them, but was going to focus mostly on the front page, which is the data. 
So as you can see, the data on this uh, document includes both six or really seven month data on the left hand side of the table and the year to date for the calendar year of 2023. Um, and please do note um, that because our data collection has improved over the course of the partnership agreement, the previous six month data report that we did in May of 2023 um, you can't add those together with this six months and get the cumulative total. Um, specifically, some of the, the mathematical reasons behind that are that in the first report, we really focus on the multidisciplinary deployment of our teams together. But this report captures a more holistic view of how teams actually deploy and, uh, and captures the data that the city teams as well as their contracted teams are doing um, in support of but not side by side with our, our behavioral health teams. Um, secondly, this report only includes the efforts and outcomes in the city of Sacramento. I do want to let the board know, because I know this is important to you, the county staff are compiling a very similar report for our co-deployment efforts in the unincorporated county in the parkway, and we'll be presenting that to you at your next board meeting on March the 26th. So you'll get very, very similar data for the unincorporated county. Um, the first report uh, the, in the table, if you look at the top half of the table, um, it uh, details the number and type of staff that are deploying in the city. I'm sorry, the little arrow part at the very top. And you can see that we have exceeded the requirements of the partnership agreement. We now have 12 behavioral health staff co-deploying with the city. The agreement requires 10. Um, in a minute, Tim Lutz from the Department of Health Services is going to expand on the work of this team. But I also wanted to note that behavioral health service access is not only through our heart outreach teams. Um, we've done, expanded our core centers. We have other mobile ways that folks who are experiencing behavioral health crises and living on shelter can access behavioral health services. So this is a portion of the great work that they're doing, but not the entirety of that. Emily, how many core centers do we have in the city? I know we have 11, to, four in the city. Thank you, four okay. in the city. And one of those is the downtown site that we committed to through the partnership. The 11th one that we added due to the partnership agreement, yes. Thank you. Um, so looking at the year-to-date numbers on the right-hand side of the table, you can see that the outreach efforts, again, which include um, efforts from Department of Community Response staff, their contracted provider, who is Hope Cooperative, um, the community health work staff, who are contracted by the managed care plans, as well as the HART team, have provided over 27,000 services to over 3,800 people living in encampments in the city of Sacramento. 373 of those exited from unsheltered homelessness, but I I do want to note this does not include those that the city teams may have transitioned to their outreach and engagement center or Miller Park. Um, and so that, that is above and beyond what's reported here. And then you can see the types of services that are most commonly provided are noted below that. Um, I'd like to pass the rest of the data discussion to Tim Lutz, um, who will detail the efforts of the behavioral health team. But before I step away, if there's questions on this general outreach data, myself or Brian Pedro from the city can answer any of those. Supervisor Hume. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, Emily, really appreciate this information and how it was disseminated. The summary with those color-coordinated dots, very easy to read. Love seeing the fact that it's, it's just populated mostly with green dots, couple yellows, and no reds. So that's very encouraging. Um, and then this report is very meaty and, and obviously a, a, a little harder to digest. But I, I wanted to, since you mentioned that you weren't going to get to the second page of it, mm. I did just want to make sure I'm reading it correctly, that uh, this is cumulative of both agencies' efforts. Yes? And so specifically what I'm asking is under new sheltering, we only mention what the county has stood up in this time frame. Is that because the city did not stand up any shelters in that time frame? No, that is because in the partnership agreement, that's all that is called out. So this is only calling out those shelter beds that were specifically required in the partnership agreement, of which there was 200 the county was to open in the county, and an additional 200 should the city provide shovel-ready sites. So this is not meaning to say the city didn't do anything above and beyond. This is just what the partnership agreement required. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, if that's, if there's no more questions for now, I'm gonna let Tim talk about the behavioral health. Thank you. Oh, 
All right. Good afternoon. Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> I'll um, I'll try and go through some of this this briefly. But again, feel free if you have questions as I go along. Um, and before I start, I, I do want to acknowledge um, the incredible Heart team: um, Sherry Green, the the division manager, but then Monica, Lupe, and Kate all here. Um, our managers and leads with the heart team um, really in the field every day uh, appreciate the amazing work that they're doing. And I, I will highlight too, um, as, as Emily alluded to, uh, behavioral health in our system, we serve over um, or just under, I should say, 35,000 um, um, clients through our system. It's, it's a very large continuum. So it's as as we go through this this data, some of the lessons that we've really learned is um, while we've been laser focused as, as we should, I think on the on the heart team and the that expansion, we've also recognized we're we're having data holes for people that we're serving in the city, helping out of homelessness, that um, is not reflected in some of this data. Um, our our big focus over this next um, six months and this next reporting period is how do we capture information from our our core centers and the navigation that they're doing, um, our mental health treatment center, um, our other field-based teams, recognizing that there, there's a lot of work that's happening and um, our, our data systems need to adjust and account for that. And, and we're, we're deeply committed to that effort, but recognizing um, what what I'm talking about here today is is work from the heart team, um, but by no means is that reflective of the totality of of the work across our behavioral health system. So. Um, Flo, if you wouldn't mind going back to that, um, the one pager sheet that Emily had. Thank you. The, the lower section of that, um, if we're able to zoom in a bit, I can move it up too. There we go, perfect. So um, I'm going to focus on the the 12 month piece. Um, what we saw: 255 individuals um, received a screening from Heart. With our Heart team engaging people in the field, um, it, the hardest part is getting someone to agree to that um, to that next level of engagement. Um, you, you know, across the entire system. I mean, talking thousands of of engagement attempts um, before. You know, we start to see um, the numbers that we're seeing in here. When they finally do agree to start to engage with the heart team, have a conversation about behavioral health, well, we see about 86% agree to be um, agree to be screened. And then within that screening, then um, we identify people who um, who, based on that screening tool, should be referred into a program. You'll notice the 255 is smaller than the 380. Um, that's because there might be people that were from a prior period that were engaged, screened, or linked later, or um, because this is reflecting HMIS information, it might also be some of the, the work of some of our um, of our other city partners through this process that actually um, got someone um, screened or our access line. So 380 individuals were enrolled or referred um, to at least one specialty behavioral health program. 79% of those, or 299, were outpatient treatment. 63 were full service partnerships, 17% um, of the referrals. And then 55 were substance use treatment. And then when we look at those individuals that were actually referred, um, the next step is really, are, are they linked and engaged with a provider? Do they go to the core center? Do they engage with the FSP provider and actually start, um, start um, engaging in services? Within our outpatient referrals, about 61% or 183 um, actually began engagement with treatment. On the FSP side, a lot, a lot better. Ninety-five percent of those that were um, actually referred in um, then began and engaged with treatment. And then on the substance use treatment side, um, seventy-eight percent or forty-three individuals um, agreed to or started treatment services. 
So, Tim, the, the, the 380 versus the 261, 380s are those that were enrolled or referred, but only 261 actually took advantage of those programs in, in a nutshell? That's correct. Uh, do, do we, you know, as far as the 120 or so that, that did not, didn't make it to the next tier, um, do we do some kind of an exit interview as to why and, I mean, you know, so, so that we can get better? You know, that's a great question. I'm looking over to the the team if because I, I hear your point again is what, why are we losing them? Yeah. How can we reengage yeah. them? Yeah. Do if you're, you want, you're, you're gonna have to take a walk. Up. Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Kate Fournier, one of the program coordinators for Heart. Um, so. The, we don't have a concrete answer for that, the reason being that many of those individuals are lost to services, meaning they get swept, they get cleared, and we don't know where they went, or they get moved on. There's a lot of reasons why people don't show up for services, but a huge one is that we can't find them. Um, we do try to provide our phone numbers, contact information. If they don't have a working phone, if they don't have a way to charge that phone, they can't reach us and we cannot reach them. So we do our best efforts to find those individuals and re-engage them in services, but oftentimes we don't know where they are and they also have to be ready and willing to take those services and that is part of the process of building rapport and re-engaging. Okay, so that, that, that leads me because these aren't necessarily the hardest of the hard to serve if they're already to the point where they are engaging at all. Uh, we know there are those that are difficult to even get it engaged. Um, so I, I, I guess it, 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 I lost my train of thought, but 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 I, I just want to make sure that, and I, and I understand it's it's difficult, and you know there, this is literally a transient, you know, community that that we're dealing with. Um, but uh, do do we keep statistics on those that are in the 380 and then eventually become in the 261? You know, I mean, is it a personal choice? Do they decide now I want to engage? And, and and let's keep the sweeps and all of that stuff on the other side. That's a completely different. But just from somebody, because it seems to me that you guys work so hard, and we keep hearing about, you know, you have to touch after touch after touch after touch. Sometimes it's a dozen, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, but. Uh, I just wonder how we can just do a better job of maintaining those touches. And, and you know, we have a conversation at the four by two all the time that it's not just about engaging in, a, in an encampment; it's about getting, engaging more importantly with individuals, and and not to be a mile wide and an inch deep just by saying, "Okay, we've been to that encampment." You got to keep going back, and that means maybe less encampments, but getting to more individuals. So, I just want to, you know, make sure that we're not giving up on folks. We, you know, some agencies think that handing out a brochure is good enough, and they said that's engagement. I understand that you guys are a bit deeper than that, and I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, I just want to make sure that we're making sure that the 120 who at least put their foot in the door, uh, that we continue to try to reach them. And I would say that we do. Um, again, when we know where they are and when we yeah. can locate them, we absolutely will continue to re-engage them. It, we respect client voice and choice. So yeah. if someone decides they're not ready or they're no longer, um, that's not the next thing that they need, then we have to respect that as well. We, we won't close the door. We, our cards are out there. Our cards get passed around all over the place. We get, we field calls. We just had an individual call uh, yesterday, I believe it was, to say, I'm ready for services now. And we went back out. Uh, they were in a different location by now, but they, it was several months that it had been and they kept our cards. So we do re-engage. Okay. Uh, we just don't always know where they are and, and we do respect what what their choice is, and, and sometimes, very often, mental health isn't their priority, it's finding a place safe, a safe place to be. Sure, but we can't get to the mental health provision without a safe place to be, typically. Correct. All right, thank you. And thank you all for what you do, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond. Well, do you have more on this page, Tim? Um, no more on this page. I did want to talk about full service partnerships a bit, but happy to. Okay, well, since you're on this page, first, you know, 
echo uh, uh, my colleagues' comments, our chair, and uh, we had a, a big conversation about that kind of um, quality versus quantity, you know, in terms of engagement. Um, and so I also want to thank the Hart team uh, for all the amazing work you're doing. And it, it strikes me as you know, all the acronyms we have in this space, the Hart team with an E, not to be confused with all the Hart teams in our respective districts, just like the, the core centers, not to be confused with the DA's core program. I mean, it's just a very difficult, um, um, you know, system and acronyms and terminology to uh, to navigate. So I had a question for you on, oh, and, and I also, I appreciate your comment about us kind of looking at the larger universe uh, where referrals may come from, because I know that was a big issue. If we're just looking at referrals from the heart team, we're not capturing everything. We are not seeing um, the additional successes we're getting from, from other sources. But just so I'm clear, so when you, in your terminology, Tim, it's really referral, enrollment, and then linkage, right? Is that, okay, so you're lumping enrolled and refer together, and linkage is actual participation. And starting with the, the screen. The screen kind of does that assessment of what level to make that referral to, you know, an outpatient treatment, FSP, substance use treatment. Okay. And then you go through exactly as, as you stated. So it's really then screening, referral, enrollment, actual linkage or Link. participation. Okay, yes. just, so I'm, just so I'm clear on that. Um, and then also with, we had this discussion during the four by two the other day too. Um, some of these folks who are, are the most difficult to reach, difficult to get into programs and may have been referred for um, AOT or, or Laura's Law. Can you talk a little bit about that and what we're seeing in Sacramento County as it relates to our homeless population? Is it, is it working well? Is it, are we struggling? How do we stack up against uh, other jurisdictions? Because it's a, it's a big part of the discussion. It, it is, and a, I, I will say AOT, Assisted Outpatient Treatment, or, or Laura's Law, the enrollment has been pretty slow within that program, um, and, and that's something that we continue to look at. We, we certainly have tried to educate our partners of its availability. Um, in December of this year, 2024, um, Care Court also will be rolling out and recognizing that we might see some more referrals come out of that program. And, and really what both of those programs are doing is providing avenues for family members or, um, you know, law enforcement, other, you know, people that are interacting with individuals to try and, and, and help somebody into treatment. Um, again, it, they're appearing before a judge, but it is still not a requirement that they engage in the program. It's still voluntary services. And so there's still that barrier of getting somebody to voluntarily agree to engage in, in those services. Thank you. I think, I think it's helpful to, for us to include reports about that um, in some of our, you know, regular reports here to the board. And then, and finally, you know, I don't know if this is a question for Emily, but when we come back in two weeks and we get a presentation about what is happening in, in the rest of the county, unincorporated county, and the other cities in the county, we will kind of have that juxtaposition with, with how that approach differs from what we're doing specifically in the city of Sacramento, correct? Will that, will that be part of that? Okay. Great. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I, I know that the, the city has had some specific questions on full service partnerships. I, I have some additional supplemental material that I submitted. I'm happy to walk through it if, if um, you would like and the board would be interested. Is there any need for the board at this time? Is anybody on the board? Sure. All right. Um, there is an additional attachment um, with the board packet. And again, I apologize. It was submitted this morning. Um, when the questions were coming up, I thought it would be a helpful visual flow. I don't know if we can pull that up. And the, if Metro has it, can you pull it up, please? <coughs> Should be the one entitled Sacramento County just PA give, give BHS us a second, Data Summary. Give us a second, Tim. The, just have them while do they're what doing they do. that, what I'll what I'll share is um, so th there are a lot of questions about what is a full service partnership. 
And why are, are we in Sacramento not seeing more of our unhoused community going into a, a, an FSP or a full service partnership? Um, a, a couple points I want to clarify. One, what we're seeing is about 17 to 22 percent of people that we're screening we are referring into a FSP. We, we feel that's a, a pretty safe and comfortable number just based on what we're seeing in, in the general population. And keeping in mind that a lot of times it's their willingness um, to engage in that level of intensive services where they're meeting with somebody daily um, and, and really on a, um, you know, it's just a high level of, of services. We um, also, um, I, I will highlight housing, um, flexible housing funds are available and much broader than just, thank you, Siobhan, um, are available much more broadly than just our, our full service partnerships. Those going to our core centers, engage in outpatient treatment, can also get access to those flexible housing funds. So it's important to note that you don't have to be in an FSP to get housing support through behavioral health. And so there are a number of ways that people enter an FSP. Screening obviously is one of those, but a lot of times you have people who are engaged in outpatient treatment and they decide that or it's, it's determined that they're willing or able to step up to a higher level of service. Sometimes they're being released from a facility and um, they're referred into an FSP. What um, what we continue to do in Sacramento is make sure we have the right number of FSP slots available to meet demand. So you can see from this chart, our current enrollees within our FSPs, um, 2,391. And our capacity right now is 2,751. So last year, um, 2023, we added 360 additional um, spots. Um, in April, um, we're taking to this board um, an additional 200 spots for our Thrive, um, which is our, our um, forensics FSP program. Supervisor Hume, please. Thank you, Chair. This is a little bit off topic, Tim, but I just wanted to ask, uh, relative to the, uh, and I always forget which bill number it was, 1483 or whatever, the one-year extension that we gave ourselves, how will that number have to change? I assume uh, the two are somewhat related. SB 43, but not necessarily a nexus. SB 43 um, is, is really looking at grave disability and those that might um, come into a 5150 hold, but okay. um, not necessarily related to the number of, of um, FSPs. What will impact it more, I and mean, we're still waiting for the final results of Prop 1, is Prop 1 um, does require 30% of MHSA expenditures to be in FSPs. So full service partnership and uh, conservatorship are not the same. They're not no. interchangeable. Okay, thank you. So um, interestingly, this is just a, a summary of FSPs per um, looked at large counties and um, adjusted it for population, recognizing that um, you know if we had. A, you know, one county, LA, is going to have a lot, although interestingly, they didn't have a lot more than we had. Um, so this is adjusted for population. You can see across the state of California, statewide average is about 1.04 um, FSPs per 1,000 people. Um, the orange bar there represents Sacramento at 1.49 per 1,000 um, people. Um, the only two counties that have a higher rate of, of FSPs at this point than us is San Diego and Kern County. So to ask the obvious question, uh, I, are we looking at what San Diego and Kern County are doing? <laughs> we, we are, particularly San Diego. They, when you look at the chart, they um, they are by and far. I mean, they have over eleven thousand FSPs. It's it's really quite a contrast to everywhere else in the state. So we are exploring kind of what is it that they're doing and is it has it been effective for them? So, now I'm getting really in the weeds. Weird question, but would it have any correlation with the number of FQHCs that are in the area because their FQHC number is far higher than ours? 
I wouldn't think it would be, but that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, we, we reached out to their behavioral health team. I'm happy to report back on, on a summary of what I'd, we find. I'd be very interested in that. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond. And Mr. Chair, it's funny, I was, I was thinking the same, along, along the same lines a little bit, and in both San Diego and Kern, is the, could the difference be more of a, a demand there, and is the population maybe a little different, or is it simply in, in the approach that they're taking where they're seeing more success addressing the, the, the challenges that people are facing in their communities, right? So that, that's part of the uh, evaluation, I imagine, right? That was one of our questions, and, and we don't feel that the demand should be that much higher or di different than what we see in, in so Sacramento, it's, it's or approach. certainly some of these other counties that have a much lower rate of FSPs. It, it really is a, an approach, okay. and so we're wanting to understand what is that approach, what's that model, and what what outcomes have they seen as a result of that? And these are all the urban counties of California that you're. Yes. You're, so we're comparing apples to apples here. Um, and and to Supervisor Hume's point. Someone who is referred to AOT may end up in an FSP, of course, right? So just want to Absolutely. clarify that. So, yeah. Yes. It and then what we're seeing, because this has come up obviously in the two by four discussions as well with the city, is you're going to be bringing um, 200, a proposal for 200 additional FSP spots to us. And, and Siobhan, I'm looking kind of at Siobhan or either one of you, as, as we see the demand grow, you're always going to keep us ahead of that number. So we are always going to have, or we anticipate always being able to have a place for people if they want to participate. No. Absolutely. And that's why if you look at that top number, you can see our, our capacity and we continue to add to that capacity. I'll show you. Thank you, Tim. I just want to, I want to make sure we underscore that because that sometimes that gets lost too. It's people not participating is not a reflection of, of a lack of capacity for them. Okay. And I'll, I'll show you this, this bottom chart is showing you kind of the growth in our FSPs over 10 years. The bars represent Sacramento. Um, and on the left-hand side, the, the number is representing um, our number of FSP slots. And then the orange line is the total FSPs within the state of California. And so you can see where that, that trending is going. Um, we've continued to add. We've, we've leveled off over a few years. Um, this, this data is based on 21-22 because it was the only years that we had comparison across the entire state to to draw on. So at fiscal year 21-22, we were at 2,374. And again, today we're at 2,751. So we continue to add to make sure we have that capacity. And that's really, again, the, the end of my summary, unless the board has additional questions. Okay, I see none. Is there another speaker? We don't have any other public comments. Okay, no public comment? No. Okay, so to the board, any comments? Hearing none. Thank you for being here, City of Sacramento. Appreciate it, we'll see you over across the street here soon. You're, you're always welcome here, I want you to know that. <laughs> right. Okay then, next item please. Okay, for item 46, these are your nominations. You're continuing to March 26th. Natomas Community Planning Advisory Council, Sacramento County Youth Commission, Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Commission, continuing to April 9th. Antelope Community Planning Advisory Council, Building Board of Appeals, Cordova Community Planning Advisory Council, Rio Linda Community Planning Advisory Council, Sacramento County Treasury Oversight Committee, and the South Sacramento Area Community Planning Advisory Council. You're continuing to April 23rd, Arden Arcade Community Planning Advisory Council, Developmental Disabilities Planning and Advisory Council, and Home Supportive Services Advisory Committee, Orangeville Community Planning Advisory Council, Sunrise Recreation and Park District, and the Sylvan Cemetery District. And for your matters today, Carmichael Old Foothill Farms Community Planning Advisory Council. Please appoint Greg Smith to replace Nick Bloys and waive the process. Second. And continue the remainder to April 9th. Thank you. Fair Oak Cemetery District. Please continue to March 26th. Got it. And uh, Galt Arno Cemetery District, Mr. Hume. Continue to March 26th. Thank you. North Highlands and Foothill Farms Community Advisory Council, Supervisor Frost. Continue to April 23, please. Okay. 
Sacramento County Behavioral Health Youth Advisory Board. I'll start with Supervisor uh, Cerna. Please continue to April 23rd. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Continue to March 26th. Supervisor Frost. Continue to April 23rd. And Supervisor Hume. Also continue to April 23rd. Thank you. Sacramento County Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. Continue to March 26th. Thank you. And Southeast Area Community Planning Advisory Council, Supervisor Hume. Continue to March 26th. Okay, thank you. That concludes your nominations. Next item. County executive comments. Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, just a couple of items real quick. One, all the chair Kennedy's done a wonderful job keeping our mornings up until this first Don't quarter. Don't get used to it. Don't get used to it. <laughs> we have a very good, uh, uh, pretty packed agenda coming in at the end of March and moving into April. So we'll have an afternoon session we expect to go forward. Um, just wanted to celebrate and highlight a couple of the fantastic uh, work that's being done in the county by your directors. Um, Director Annette Bed Bedsworth from Animal Care has continued to share that our animal shelters are always, our animal shelter is always full. Um, she was able to go out and get a grant to provide free spay and neuter clinics, or free spay and neuter to those folks in the um, um, McClellan area off of uh, um, Roseville Road and Watt Avenue. Um, she held a clinic this weekend, a three-day clinic. They were able to spay and neuter about 192 um, cats and dogs, which continues to help support and reduce our our overpopulation of, of animals here in the county. Um, they are working on another one um, towards the end of May, early June in the Florence Center. So the first one was done near Supervisor Cerna's, um, Supervisor Desmond, Supervisor Frost um, uh, districts, but the next one on Florin will be also looking at Supervisor Cerna and Supervisor Kennedy's area. That'll also be a three-day free clinic to those in the community for um, spay and neuter clinics, or spay and neuter of those folks. We're also working on a third opportunity maybe um, to help out the southernmost part of our district and the Delta uh, down up into Elk Grove or maybe in the Galt area that uh, Supervisor Hume has been supporting. So um, we're, st we're still working on those details, but they've been doing a fantastic job. Uh, Annette does a wonderful job out there. The other piece I would just uh, alert you to is um, last meeting I, I brought up the elections. Um, as you know, we have about 868,000 registered voters this year or this last March Fifth, we had 323,000, approximately 323,000 voters. Most of those folks mailed via the um, the mail. Um, there was only a small uh, amount, about 14,000, that cast their vote in person. These are incredibly tight races. Uh, Supervisor Desmond's doing very well in his district. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I want to recount. And, and then Supervisor <laughs> and then Supervisor uh, Frost um, has uh, three individuals um, going in that in that area too. Um, there is uh, Supervisor um, Cerna. You brought up some security and some other issues at the last meeting. We we're able to get a news story out that day, if not the next day, mm -hmm. on the security. It was picked up very well in the media and and um, provided a tremendous amount of uh, safety and security that uh, super, our, um, Director Hang uh, Nguyen provides and the fantastic job that um, voter registration does out in that area to provide that services. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. Um, I, just as a reminder, because these are tight races and a lot of folks are interested in much of the outcomes, just as a reminder, we do update um, our the voter registration and elections office does update every Tuesday and Friday afternoon about 4 15 or before the latest status of the elections. They still have about 140,000 uh, ballots to count. Um, they'll post a whole, he uh, whole host of them today at 415, and um, they'll continue to count. They have 28 days to certify the election, so they still have about three more weeks to go. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much. Next item. Your comments. Supervisor comments, yeah. reports, and announcements. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing no one punching in. Uh, I will just say, uh, ask my colleagues, I, I know it's difficult to fill uh, all of the vacancies we have in boards and commissions, but the County Behavioral Health Youth Advisory Board, um, if, if you could take a look at that just because there's some really exciting stuff coming up the, to get them engaged, and so we'd love to have opportunity to have every district represented, that'd be great. And with that, thank you very much. We do have closed session and we're adjourned.